Sup, my fellas, don't forget to leave feedback and enjoy the story. The manhwa begins with a character explaining that three days have passed since the event that inspired him to write the book occurred. We discover it's similar to possession, something that would occur in the world of webcomics, and he didn't anticipate going through that exact possession himself. He's surprised to still be in his current body, and despite his best efforts to rub his eyes out of the character information status screen, he cannot. We find out that his name is Larson Maiden, and that he actually controlled a supporting Starcross character who appeared in the book. In nine years, his brothers would kill him. On the first day, we see him wake up yelling, and the maid begins to apologize profusely and gets on her knees, saying she's committed a crime worthy of death. He wonders who she is and says she doesn't look Korean or Western, and asks her where he is. She apologizes again, saying she didn't know he had to wake up while bashing her head into the floor. This shocks him, and he asks if she's okay and she is scared and screams don't hit me. And we learn she passed out from him standing up. He discovers his name has changed from Cha Soo-min and that he met a boy named Hampton on the second day, who keeps track of his daily log and apologizes and promises to finish quickly when Larson inquires about it. As Larson observes him, it becomes clear that, starting at age 14, the descendants of respectable families are constantly being watched and their daily activities are being recorded by a third party. He spills ink all over the book after being startled by Larson and apologizes, promising to clean it up right away. Because Larson feels as though his body is responding on its own, we see Larson kick the boy in the face. When he was four years old, he used a toy stick to beat up the servants who looked after him, one of them was Hampton. After the second day, he began to regain his memories. He discovered the truth about his birth at the age of five, discovering that he was a child born from a maid servant. He treated his mother poorly and spit in her face because he was afraid of his father but had no fear for her. He committed this crime when he was just seven years old, and overall, he has a terrible personality. He would repeatedly commit atrocious acts against the servants while just going on the rampage. And when he was eight, he beat up a little girl with a stick, and afterward, he went around bragging about it, because the girl Rosalind is six years old, and the only daughter of a reputable martial arts family, and because of this Larson's father had to bow his head to the Grandel family's head and apologize. Larson was exiled to a remote mansion before turning nine, and we can see that a few days ago, he had a temper tantrum over some chocolate. And once more, we discover that Larson appears in a book by Cha Sung Min. And while Larson was designed to be a rat, he wasn't created with this much detail or memories. And this isn't a world that Cha Sung Min wrote about. Since he didn't live in this world, everything that happened there happened on its own. The third day we see him acknowledging the possession, and that it isn't a dream, but a reality, and that the Larson from his novel had no details about how he looked or his abilities, because he only appeared occasionally, and since it wasn't set on when he would appear he has a talent for martial arts, and it's a trait he wrote down, but never used. He had no talent, in the eyes of the reader, and he passed away at the age of 17. Larson decides to put survival first. Since he is nine years old and has another eight years before being put to death, he can dream of a future for those eight years, but what happens after that poses a problem. The true protagonist of the novel Cass and Chade is bound to fight against the Maiden family, because long ago, the Maiden's family had killed the first son of the Swordsman family on accident, and it was a complicated scenario that has kept hidden for quite a while, but due to it being found out the two families went to war and since the novel is named after the Chade family, they obviously won the war and the Maiden family was pretty much destroyed. He wonders what to do, and when he should do it, and even though it was a poorly created world, he is still the creator, so all of the plot armor meetings that Kassan had were made by him, so he knows the future. He made a commitment to benefit from these opportunities and live a better life than he had in the past. It would be a good idea to enjoy it since he only gets to live the life once. Even Larson didn't realize how powerful the martial arts trait was, and because he is descended from one of the world's three great families, he is probably a genius. So he was given the good fortune to be born. In light of the fact that he is a rat and only has eight years left to live, he must take action. He notices the status window again, and we see it mentioning that he's activated the heavenly eye, and Larson is shocked because this was the ability of Kassan. It means the status window he's seeing is the heavenly eye, but wonders why he has it because he isn't the protagonist. He explains more about Kassan's ability, and how the novel is a munchkin and min-maxer fantasy novel, and that Kassan is strong enough to destroy the entire planet, and even the universe, and the problem here is that he used that same power to destroy the maintenance. When Larson looks down, he sees a ring that he wouldn't normally be able to see, almost as if his body were being examined. He wonders if it's signifying the first circle, and he explains that circle refers to a ring that is created by gathering mana around the heart, and it is used as a fuel container when using magic. 
We learn that in the story he wrote, it requires a lot of effort and time to get even the first circle, and that a rat like Larson wouldn't train magic, and he doesn't remember him training either, so it appeared automatically. When he hears a knock at the door, he assumes it is Hira, and she requests permission to enter. He tells the maid to kneel when she sees him as we see the maid bending down. The rules he previously established have Larson irritated. He is shocked when he sees her status window, and we see that Hira has a talent in assassination. He doesn't recall giving her a talent for that, so he wonders why she has it. He comments that the world in the novel is crazy and it's not different from an uncivilized wilderness, so someone intentionally placed an assassin by his side. And they sent the assassin there even though it's a remote location, so it has to be someone fighting to be the successor. He must remind himself to remain calm and smile, even if it is forced, as she might kill him if she spots an opening. He is aware that he could die, and he understands that her tears and her fear of him were all acting. He realizes her trembling is real, at least that's what the heavenly eye is telling him. He calls to her and tells her to bring him some chocolates, and he wants her to get out so he can sort out his thoughts. We see her outside the room, wondering what happened, because the expression he gave off seemed different than before, and she noticed it a few days ago that the air around him feels different, something completely different. We see her float down the hallway like an Erd tree burial watchdog, and it cuts to Larson going through all the information he has. He mentions again he's been banished to this mansion, and his father has abandoned him and pushed him to the bottom of the successor ranks. And even if he has no chance of being a successor, he's still monitored, and that his family has a villain-type role in the story. But he decides to behave like a decent person to ensure his survival, and now he possesses the power of the protagonist and knows the future, and where the artifact is located, so he must participate in the succession war, because if he doesn't, he'll be marked as trash. And here, he can live his life without worry, he can travel and enjoy being carefree, and just needs to maintain a middle position so he doesn't overstep his boundary or underperform, and he's done it before as a soldier. Now he has a clear idea of how to behave, his heavenly idea activates, and Hira opens the door saying she shouldn't find the chocolate, and he tells her it's okay. She begins to say she's committed a crime worthy of death again, but is interrupted, and Larson tells her to get lost. Since he needs to maintain the scoundrel image and mentions it's scary, she doesn't make a sound. He tells her to get lost again. Outside the door, we see her wondering if she heard him wrong, and that someone who usually goes crazy over chocolate says it was okay. So she'll observe him more before making a report. It cuts to one week later, we see Larson telling Hampton to get ready. And Hampton asks what for, and he tells him he's going to the training building. He is being questioned by Hampton, and Larson shouts that he needs to repeat himself. Larson gave a lot of thought to this last week, and he concluded that in order to survive, he must take part in the succession war, put in a lot of effort in his training, and achieve independence. It's time to put that power to use. Hampton is aware of how things have changed. He used to beat him frequently for not helping him properly, but now he wants to work out. Back in the beginning, we see that Larson had discovered Hampton's talent in poison, and he believed this was because he was getting ready to face him, and that each successor is given a skilled assistant who serves as their personal assistant. They devote their lives to this cause and are known as shadows. It then cuts to the training facility. Hampton is pleased to see him there for training, but he is curious about the sudden changes. He is not worried about him getting into trouble, but rather, his heart aches when he sees people despise Larson, so he chooses to believe in him. Although Larson thinks he did a lousy job with the setting and is surprised to see the training facility as a modern structure in a fantasy setting, he is at ease because it is what he is used to. Each of the buildings has an administrator who lives there, and in this scene, Larson is introduced to Noah, the administrator of the Leaf Building. He returns the greeting and tells us that he once slapped Noah for not bowing all the way to him because he didn't remember him. Noah resists Larson's attempts to look into his heavenly eye, which he attributes to the fact that he must be strong. Larson then decides not to be arrogant and instead to be kind to Noah. Larson requests advice on what type of training to begin with and a monster that would be appropriate for his age. We learn that Noah has a grudge against Larson and suggests that he engage in a mushroom monster fight as retaliation after asking him his age. Larson recalls writing about it and assures him that it will work. Larson wonders why Noah is so happy when Noah says the preparation will only take a few minutes. According to Larson, the monster should be a simple one for the sixth young master to defeat who wasn't mentioned in the writing. Larson concentrates on the Mona surrounding his heart and realizes that magic combat is his talent and that he is already proficient in using magic. Noah notifies him that it is prepared, and we then see Larson in a mock mushroom forest. Noah wishes him luck as he shuts the room's door. We see a tiny mushroom-like object bouncing while Larson sees the monster. He makes the decision to begin and starts to mana charge his fist. A status window appears stating that the magic combat technique in his body has been activated. The will of his physical body has been confirmed, and he can feel the magic circle moving. 
The monster he's fighting is at the highest level, and Larson's technique is thought to be low level, so he can't damage it with a technique without any elemental attributes, and with this, he'll get his revenge. Noah claims that before he joined the Maiden family, he was considered a genius, but Larson humiliated him for not bowing far enough. Today, he'll make up for that. He is stunned to see Larson leaping at the monster with his glowing fist. Noah is startled when Larson punches a hole through it. Larson is taken aback by how simple it was. Larson's status screen appears once more, updating him on his approach and stating that the unpredictable events are starting to follow a pattern. And we see a technique called weight utilization being imprinted on his circle, which surprises him. He can also feel the blood rushing through his heart. Noah is perplexed by Larson's demonstration of a pure magic technique and the fact that the mushrooms have physical resistances despite the fact that the technique deals physical damage. Larson and Noah both agree that the mushroom monster doesn't seem to be up to par. Larson mentions that he nearly ran out of mana and asks Noah how much the difficulty will increase by when he says he's thinking about doing so. Noah tells him that even though it isn't much, he must get rid of it quickly before the monster spreads. Noah sets aside his resentment and decides to gather data for his report. If he believes it will be risky, he will halt the training. He narrowly avoids the monster's sudden attack and watches as it flies back at him, but he blocks it. Larson remarks that he didn't write about the mushrooms in detail, and we see the monster appear, wondering what the difference is besides color. He remarks on its speed and claims that it is not frightening. Noah is surprised when we see it launch at him again, but he blocks it. It's a simple pattern, so Larson says he'll use his ability. He grabs it and uses his ability to fill his hand with mana, but he soon realizes he doesn't have enough. Nevertheless, he strikes it, saying that it seemed as though time had slowed down. We then see his heavenly idea come to life, and he decides to examine what transpired once he has more mana. Hampton is taken aback by what he saw and questions whether Larson has prepared himself. Noah wonders why he is so strong despite not having gone through his tenth year ceremony, and inquires as to whether he has. Larson's mana circle surprises Hampton, who cries and hugs him after concluding that he has been training covertly. Larson decides he needs to act subdued after realizing his commotion, so he pretends to be unconscious. Larson is instructed by Noah to find a healing mage. When Hampton wakes up a healer, he is shocked to learn that the seventh son, not the sixth, is present. It then cuts to the healer observing Larson and remarking that it would be difficult to treat him if he were hurt as a result of one of his techniques. As a result, the healer decides to pretend to treat Larson before passing him off to a more experienced mage. The man decides to half-ass it after casting a healing spell that, as was to be expected, had no effect because it would never have worked in the first place. The mage is shocked when he sees Larson open his eyes and wonders if his healing skills have improved. Everyone is shocked when they hear Larson thank him. He tells her it's okay to just leave those and go, while thinking that he doesn't want to torture her any longer. She brought chocolates for Larson and apologizes that there are only two. He says he needs to go because he is exhausted from training. When Hampton informs her that Larson went to train, she is shocked and exits the scene. It then cuts back to Larson eating chocolate, saying that he usually dislikes it but that this particular bar makes him feel better. However, he notices something and uses his heavenly eye to see that the chocolate is spreading throughout his body, and we discover that it gives him mana. He is so mana because of this. He thinks the character is developing, and he assumes that this is the result of the predictability being reorganized, though he is still taken aback by eating chocolate to increase mana. It was unpredictable before because normally, mages search for areas that are filled with mana and struggle to absorb it. However, it appears that Larson has a special constitution that he didn't write about. Here we see a knock on the door and we see Larson's other brother arrives, and he is extremely rude to Larson, and the side effect of free mana appears to be weight gain, and he wonders what the flow slowly talent he gained previously is. Carlin's brother, of whom Larson was once afraid, is greeted by Larson. Larson is perplexed when Carlin asks him what he is doing, he then informs him that he ought to be creeping into Neil like a bug. Larson deflects the swing, knocking the weapon out of Carlin's hands, and this enraged him. However, Larson's flow slowly, talent activates, and he can see the swing in slow motion, so he decides to find out how strong the talent is. He yells at Larson, threatening to kill him, and asks what he is doing. He summons some mana, and as he commands Larson to commit suicide, we see water forming around his fist. Upon observing some water on his face and abdomen, Larson decides it will be problematic if their formation continues. As a result, Larson breaks them, quickly runs behind him, and then reappears in front of him to strike him in the stomach. He yells for Hampton to send a healing mage as his brother starts to cough up blood, and if it's because he attacked him before his magic appeared, he wonders. When Hampton enters the room and inquires about the situation, Larson tells him to go get a mage again and sends him on his way. Larson admits he went too far, but the experience taught him how to defeat a mage the best way possible. The following day, Hira and Hampton are seen talking. 
Hira is shocked that Larson beat Carlin, and Hampton goes to tell her that he is actually a shadow. Hira responds by telling him that she is aware of this and that everyone else is aware as well. He comments that she is too quiet to be a typical maidservant, and she replies that everyone knows. And she tells him to keep talking when he asks if she still thinks he's a scoundrel. As the ceremony draws closer, he says that he believes Larson is sincere. The scene then cuts to Larson standing outside the library, where he is astounded by its size as he is that he has never been. He says he wonders how many books there are because he can see so many of them. He is informed that there are 200,000, and he is curious as to where the voice is coming from. He sees a woman emerge from a rainbow aura. She identifies herself as the librarian Evan when he asks who she is. Hira asks Hampton if what he believes makes any sense as the scene switches back to their conversation. And when Hampton speculates that Larson may have been hiding his talent all along, he responds that he has personally witnessed it, has completed the first circle, and asks if it can happen instantly. And to reflect on the fact that despite his actions, nobody has mentioned his name and consider how convenient it is that only Hira is keeping an eye on him, which is why he has purposefully kept a low profile. She claims that it is absurd and questions whether his abilities extend beyond fighting techniques. Hampton asserts as much, and he is confident in everything he has said thus far because he is his shadow, has shown him there is a future and will leave them alone if he passes away. Therefore, they ought to cooperate rather than allowing that to happen. Hira says she'll think about it if he visits the library, and maiden members vying for the succession war must conduct research there and come up with a plan. Then, when Evian is introducing herself, Larson can't recall who she is. Using Heavenly Eye, he can see that her real name is Larvian, which he is familiar with. She expresses gratitude for the opportunity to meet him and reveals that, despite not having engaged Kasim directly, she is one of the most powerful mages. She once killed a lord and his knights by turning them into icicles and even frozen their entire castle. He is surprised that she is here despite the fact that she is wanted because what she does in the future is basically a disaster. And he questions why she had to be the librarian and why she is only looking at him. She offers him black tea and motions for him to take a seat before serving him. She vanishes after he claims to like it despite not actually liking it. It's his first time here, and he's glad of it because he doesn't know what the original Larson would have done. He explains that he is there to read a book about monoculture when she asks him why he is there. When she inquires as to what kind, he responds, the simplest books. She finds the phrase redundant, and he essentially tells her to better be safe than sorry, which confuses her. He tells her she can leave now after she finds a book for him and gives it to him using magic. She walks away, and we see him reading the mana book. From this, we learn that mana is the term used to describe all forms of energy found in nature, and that in order to become a mage, one must first create a ring and he explains some nonsense related to quantum physics, which is confusing because this is supposed to be the most basic book, and that the information is simply too strange, but he realizes that if he can't do it, he won't understand. He uses his heavenly eye to see that the completion rate is 5% and that his power for word analysis is monstrous. Another issue is that Kassin, who also possesses the talent, employs it far more skillfully than Larson. As the percentage increases, he questions whether he will fully comprehend it at 100%. After solving his mana issue, he decides to call it a day. When the scene returns to the mansion, Hampton tells Larson that Lady Soso is there. Larson recognizes her and wonders why his mother showed up at this precise moment. He says that in his previous life, he never got to see his mother and watched her die in the hospital, so he always missed her. And the emotional toll this took on him was great. But he is surprised to see how much she resembles his mother, and he also discovers that she suffers from a condition known as the blue dot. He is seen drinking tea with his mother while reflecting on what the previous Larson did to her. He calls out to her and confesses his lack of direction. Initially, we see Hero wondering if Larson was acting or not, and then we see Larson apologizing to his mother. She is shocked, and he explains that he's come to his senses even though he's not sure if she will believe him. Her voice quivers as she asks, is that so? Larson's mother only listened to him apologize and offered brief explanations. The tone of her voice made it clear why she did so. She informs him that she has work to do and that she will return later. Larson is aware that since she is no longer a maid servant, she has no work to do. He goes on to describe the blue dot illness in more detail. Once there are three blue dots, the illness is incurable, but there are currently only one. No one knows why or how to treat it. His mother can be seen sobbing behind the door as she questions why she keeps crying given how wonderful the day is. Finally, her own son gave her mother a call. Larson calls out to her and asks if it's alright if she spends an hour with him every day. She consents when he says they will share a cup of tea. He explains that she is still his mother, that she has never given up on him, that the tea may be able to cure the blue dot disease, and that he hopes she remains healthy. When it cuts tonight, we see his mother speculating that he has transformed into a different person and that everything is just a dream. 
A candle flickers as she calls out to someone, asks if they are listening, and tells them what happened today. The next day we see Larson telling Hira that he's going to tell her something important, and she wonders if he found out who she is and wonders if he's going to ask her to assassinate someone. She wonders why she was expecting anything when he says he wants more chocolate, but only the special kind, and he adds that he has one more thing to share with her. And she thinks it's the important thing, but he just asks for more sweets, which disappoints her. Larson is seen an hour later staring at a mountain of diabetes before giving into his sweet tooth and indulging in the chocolate. He makes a comment about the various prices and how, depending on the quality, they provide varying amounts of mana. And that the other bakery he told Hira about has the potential to provide mana as well. And that's because they both contain the same ingredient. He calls out to Hampton and tells him to get him the baker, and 30 minutes later, we see the man standing before him. He wonders why he's been called for and is scared because of the rumors surrounding Larson and afraid he might kill him. He hopes everything is alright and Larson asks what he put into the sweets and to tell him every ingredient. The baker begins to apologize and Larson tells him he hasn't made a mistake. He just wants the recipe. The baker tells him the recipe and he recognizes the ingredient between the both of them, which is the thousand-year herb, and he realizes that's how he can gain more mana. It cuts to the training hall, and Noah is informed by the healer that Larson beat up Carlin, and Noah thinks he's a lunatic. Noah wonders when he got so powerful, and the mage asks if he thinks Larson did it because of the upcoming ceremony, and that Larson beat the hell out of his brother, and wasn't aware he had that much skill. Noah warns him that even if he develops quickly as a result of his combat style, there is a limit, and he won't be able to surpass the Grandels and won't be able to incorporate elemental spells because everyone has abandoned that field of study. The scene returns to Larson eating the thousand-year herb, and he remarks that unlike chocolate, which made him chubby, he can eat these without gaining calories. However, he can now burn fat with his core instead, and he can grow quickly by boosting his mana and using Heavenly Eye. After processing the magical book he had been reading for three days, he receives a notification that a hidden page from the Great Sage has surfaced. He notices that the Great Sage left his mana cultivation technique and wonders who that is. However, in order to find out, he must visit the library. However, he is afraid of Evian and would prefer to avoid her, but he is left with no other option. On this ceiling above him, we can see someone watching him. She jumps out at him, scaring him, and he hands her the book he borrowed as the scene cuts to the library and he wonders where Evian is. She asks if he's looking for anything else before quickly throwing the book containing it back. She tells him that the great sage Alberto's book is in the library when he asks about it, and when she refuses to give it to him because it is too difficult to understand, he says he just wants to look at it for fun. He likens the sensation to a predator smelling their prey as she starts to sniff him. She comments on his pleasant scent, and he pulls out a chocolate bar to see if it matches. He then asks her if she would like some. She quickly grabs the chocolate as she quickly says, no, adding, if he's going to force me, I might as well take it. She's acting in a way that surprises him, and he wonders why. As he's about to leave, he wonders how she'll react to a compliment, so he offers to let Hira know about her if she wants more chocolate to come to the mansion. He wonders if she'll show up and secretly wishes she won't. The status screen shows that he is 42% of the way through understanding the book as he is seen staring at it. He complains that the book isn't as exciting as he had anticipated and wishes it weren't full of strange assertions made by the Great Sage. The scene then shifts to the outside, where Hira and Hampton can be seen observing Larson running and remarking on his recent changes. When Hampton inquires as to why it's not a typical workout, we see Evian appear behind them and explain that he is melting mana while exercising. The librarians are supposed to be impartial in the succession war, so they are shocked by her sudden appearance. Hampton asks if he should tell Larson she is there, but she responds that he doesn't have to. He then wonders why she is there and realizes she is a high-ranking magician. Evian claims that the rumors are different from reality. Hira explains to Evelyn that she was supposed to give her chocolate if she came by even though she had no idea how much she would enjoy it. Hira assumes Evian must be incensed to be accepting it as a gift, so Evian quickly accepts it and returns to watching. Hira is perplexed as to why Larson gave her chocolate and what transpired between them. Three days later, the scene is cut off and he has finished examining the book and how it is assimilating its contents. He's glad it's over, but is overcome by a feeling that brings him to his knees. He feels as if his heart is going to explode. He realizes if he doesn't properly read the flow. His heart will explode and that he needs to read it with the heavenly eye and is shocked to learn that you could die just from misinterpreting a book and he begins to focus. Later in the day, he finally engraved the lesson from the book and as a result of its influence, he is now able to see the background information that he was previously unable to see. He starts to understand the history of the universe, and now he will have the opportunity to learn more about the unpredictability and the strange sensation from Evian, who reveals that she enjoys chocolate. He remembers writing something down in his backstory notebook while watching a friend's son, 
but now he realizes why Evian's behavior was odd. He is startled to see that he is surrounded by fire and hears a voice telling him that it is useless for someone like him to focus. However, he soon realizes that the fire is not hot and notices a figure. He wonders why his sister Persia is here after she calls out and inquires as to whether he has a death wish. We learn Persia has three characteristics. She then asks if she should cut him up, revealing that her hobby is dismembering people because she despises weak people. She becomes irritated that he isn't responding, and he attempts to apologize. However, he quickly realizes that this is a bad idea and concludes that she must have given him a test unintentionally. She encourages him to continue as he explains to her that he wasn't acting focused and that this is his only opportunity. She starts to laugh as he explains that he was actually paying attention and that he is aware that she is saying this to test him to see if he would lie or apologize. He responds by saying he's trying to live as a decent person moving forward after she remarks that the rumors about him changing were true. She summons a fire snake and tells him it's a little late for that because once he thinks it's too late, it really is too late. He tells her that he knows he cannot be the patriarch because he is aware of his potential for evil but that he can assist someone else in taking over his patriarch as the snake coils around him. He responds by saying he'll turn into an unexpected variable and she asks if he'll even be useful. She tells him to keep talking. She asks who he wants to support, and he replies that it will depend on whoever decides to use him. He acknowledges that his sister Ivelia is frequently mentioned, and he tells Persia that he is aware of her fear of her. Larson says it feels like he's going to be burned alive as her fire snake starts hissing at him and the fire heats up. He is talking nonsense now, she tells him, but she let him speak because she thought he was cute. Larson tells her that he is aware of her dislike of lies and that he would rather speak the truth than show weakness. He also states that while he may submit to honor, he will not submit to power. He says he hopes she will forgive him because he spoke the truth and we see the flames go out. She calls him an idiot and pulls out a ball, hitting him in the stomach with it. It was an apple, which he can see when he looks down. We also observe that he acquired a new magic combat maneuver as a result of her hitting him. She instructs him to consume it and explains that she found it on the ground on the way here. When he examines the apple, he discovers that it is actually a Carson, a mana elixir. As the youngest of the maiden's children, Larson argues that this is plausible and that, although Carson is likely also inundated with gifts, he wouldn't have room for a Carson, making him superior in this regard. Persia is heard saying that the scoundrel actually completed a first circle from self-study and that if he has been acting in this manner throughout, he is very cunning and that she needs cunning individuals for her war. She praises his courage but remarks that it is clear what his limits are. He has no chance of succeeding his father as patriarch. She summons her shadow Sando and commands her to keep peddling false information about her brother and prevent him from seeing their other siblings. She tells Sando to watch over him because she doesn't know if he ate the Carson and because it would be awkward if anyone found out. If he doesn't eat it, however, it will get interesting, and it will be acceptable for her to amputate his limbs if he is foolish enough to refuse what she has offered him. The Carson warns Larson that he will die if he consumes too much of it and that he needs the assistance of a mage, preferably one who is skilled with the use of water, ice, and wind. He questions why she gave it to him and considers whether she wants him to owe her money, but he later realizes that she most likely did it merely out of curiosity. She'll likely use him if he properly absorbs the Carson, but he is unsure whether she'll keep him by her side or discard him. He understands he needs an ice maid's assistance at this point because if he doesn't consume it, she will undoubtedly amputate one of his limbs. He considers Evian, but claims she will probably kill him instead so that everyone will believe he has passed away and she can take the Carson. We see Evian approaching his door, which is just what he considers to be the worst case. Realizing that he cannot simply conceal it because she has probably already picked up on the Carson's mana, he calls her inside. He calls her over and admits that he knows she's noticed it and that he didn't want to keep it a secret. He then asks if she wants to strike a deal. He says he needs her assistance because he is unable to consume it on his own. She reminds him that since she is a librarian, she must maintain her impartiality and is unable to help him in the succession dispute. He explains to her that he's not asking for assistance with that and that all he wants is to devote himself to magic and increase his skill as a mage. He sounds like a model mage, she observes, and someone has been spreading unfavorable rumors about him. She responds that the children of the Maiden family would spend their entire lives trying to become patriarch when he says he has no intention of taking part in the succession war. He claims that has nothing to do with it and that he simply wants to get stronger. She continues, regardless of that, I am unable to participate as the librarian, so ask a Maiden mage for assistance. He expresses his inability to trust them and his sincere desire to shield his mother by pleading with her for assistance. She is surprised by this and remembers seeing a mother give her life for her son after he defended her and it is revealed that she assassinated the aforementioned king for that reason. She makes remarks about how Larson has lived under constant surveillance, how his family abandoned him, and how Larson had to put on a show in order to diminish his value. 
He's serious about watching his mother, but it's impossible because everyone in the Maiden family is strong, while he's just a scoundrel who happened to be born into a lowly family. Although his dream cannot be realized, she maintains that it is still valid and that dreams do not always have to be realized, they can also be pursued. She clarifies that she is not assisting you because of the chocolates. Larson is seen to be content as she gets ready to give him the caution and explains her plans, and that he runs the risk of having a frozen body, which, with any luck, would only last for a few months at most, and at worst, a few years or death. He asks her how she can say it so coolly, and she replies that she's a strong mage and will try to prevent it. He thinks about waiting to take in the warning, but he knows he must do this and that Evelyn will try to prevent any problems. She reminds him that she is still a fully-fledged mage and will need to be paid for her services even though he says he is ready, and tells him to give him 24 chocolates because it's not much. When asked if Larson had consumed the warning, a bloodied Persia cuts to Sando, who replies that Evian had assisted Larson. She wonders how he persuaded her to do that and inquires as to whether she meant the librarian. Sando apologizes and claims that is all she knows because she was unable to get any closer. Persia remarks that the caution was a special grade, so if it weren't for someone of Evian's level assisting him, he would have died while ingesting it. Persia is surprised by his trump card and demands to know if he knows that Evian's name is Larvian. Sando replies that he has, but as a side effect, his body has grown incredibly strong, which even surprised Evian. Even his rate of consumption was quick. Sando is asked how long it will take him to fully absorb all of the mana. Persia replies that it usually takes three years, but that he will probably complete it in one. Sando informs Persia that, based on the current rate of progress, three weeks will be sufficient. It cuts to him running and he says that despite having run for several hours, he is not tired. He also says that it feels like there is too much mana and that it is about to explode. He requests that Hampton drive him to the waterfall garden, where he climbs the waterfall and claims that it will be more exhausting than running. He then requests that Hampton bring him some sort of lead weight. As he ascends, we see how his magic technique starts to defend his body and evolve in tears. He remarks on how much lighter his body feels. We watch as he gains weight week after week while Hampton warms him up to prevent injury. Larson remarks that despite not getting much sleep recently, he is bursting with energy. Samba then tells Persia that he has fully absorbed the Karshan's mana, that he has a monstrous body, and that he has been ascending the waterfall every day. Samba responds to Persia's inquiry about his use of magic by stating that he employs magic combat techniques. Persia observes that although combat techniques are rapidly evolving, their potential is soon exhausted. Persia is perplexed when Samba tells her that he has been climbing with 50 kilograms and inquires as to whether she means 5 kilograms. Persia remarks that he is bursting with energy and wonders how long he can live, and Samba adds that he ascends it quickly. Samba claims that if they leave him alone, he will pass away in three months because his body contains too much mana and would have exploded without Persia's assistance. However, if Persia aids him, he may live. Persia claims it's problematic and that she's already taken care of her part, so for the time being they should just wait. They must determine how he persuaded Evian to assist him if it appears that he will perish. When the scene returns to Larson, he remarks on how much the mana has altered him. It shows him having tea with his mother. When she inquires about his weight loss, he replies that it is simply the result of exercise. He responds that he is in excellent health, despite the fact that she tells him it's nice to look good. The tea Hira made is then complimented by his mother, who also compliments Hira. Larson is pleased that his mother and Hira get along and remarks on how much Hira's blue dot has faded as well and how well things are going. It then cuts to Larson lying in bed discussing the dates. He says that his birthday is significant, but the real significance is that someone named Ludo will arrive at his home from the West Gate. They are members of the Fire Tribe and are known as the Crimson Butcher and the One-Armed Sorceress, and that she will get into some trouble, be expelled through the West Gate, but will be apprehended by his sister, which is how she lost one of her arms. She harbored resentment for the maintenance workers after that day, became Kaysen's greatest ally, and possesses the power of fire. Kaysen also makes a deal with her tribe and helps them fight in battle. So if he could obtain one of the artifacts from her that would have gone to Kaysen, that would be fantastic. He spots a person moving stealthily and knows that she is Persia's shadow. He chooses to deactivate his heavenly eye in order to avoid noticing her and decides that it is better to pretend ignorance. He tries to turn it off but can't, so he decides to pretend to be asleep. She misunderstands the situation and is shocked to learn that he can cultivate his mana while sleeping. She also mentions how dangerous the task is and how even a momentary lapse in concentration can result in death. She is perplexed and unsure of how to file a report. She doesn't think it's an outstanding technique and only learned the basics, so she is surprised that it works while he sleeps and is stable. She also remarks on his ability to combine his own mana with that of Karshan, how he underwent a significant physical transformation, and how the combined mana is being drawn into his heart. 
However, he appears to be far too healthy and has no heart problems. Instead, his mana is steadily stabilizing and his heart is unusually powerful. When he finally decides to stop pretending to be asleep, the scene cuts to him outside telling Hampton and Hira to follow him. When they inquire as to their destination, he replies that they are going to the West Gate. We discover that there are four gates, the West Gate being the outermost one, and that he will be meeting Lucia today. We observe a girl panting as she threatens to kill some individuals while igniting her hand. Larson questions whether it is too late to stop her. We can see from Lucia's character description that she is incredibly smart, and he regrets having written her in such a careless manner. When Hampton inquires as to what she is doing, Larson instructs him to spread poison that will paralyze Lucia no matter what. Hampton hurls the poison in her direction, and as it flies over her head and explodes into powder, she collapses onto her face. When one of the guards asks Larson who he is and he replies that he is from inside, the guard calls Larson incompetent and wonders how he is a gatekeeper. When the gatekeeper asks who he is, Larson replies that he will be taking Lucia. The gatekeeper then instructs Larson to reveal his identity because he is unable to take Lucia. Larson is identified to the gatekeeper as the seventh son after Hampton clears his throat and starts spitting out information about his family. The gatekeeper yells that they obviously don't know what Larson looks like and that he is ugly, asking what kind of nonsense that is. Since everyone knows that Larson is a scoundrel and an ugly pig, Larson asks for his name and promises to remember it. He also inquires as to whether he truly believes that anyone would attempt to impersonate Larson, and again asks if he thinks anyone would try to impersonate him. If he doesn't think it's Larson, send someone to the main family to verify it. However, if he acts haughty and disregards his warnings, Larson will make sure he pays dearly when he realizes he's the young master. The gatekeeper apologizes, kneels before Larson, and inquires as to why Larson is attempting to remove the girl. Hira looks perplexed as Larson, who had no good reason, decides to wing it and tells the gatekeeper that she is attractive. The gatekeeper replies that he understands. Everyone is watching Lucia as she is tied up in the cutting room floor. Larson receives notification that a new variable has emerged as a result of the disruption to predictability. As Larissa awakens and starts barking at them, Larson wonders what it is. Due to the tape covering her mouth, he is unable to understand her, but realizing that he must treat her gently, he inquires as to whether her father is ill. And he tells her that he knows why she is here, his mother is ill, and that he is aware that she is a Hirani mage and a member of the Tribe of Fire. Moreover, he is aware that her region is currently dealing with an epidemic, but he also knows how to treat it, and that she likely arrived here carelessly because she believed his family possessed the solution, and requests that she nod her head in agreement to show that she understands what he just said. She asks if she has calmed down now and nods as she asks Hira to remove the tape from her mouth. She queries whether he will in fact be of assistance, to which he replies that he has already promised to do so. She responds that nobles won't assist for free, at least that's what her father said, and he says it doesn't matter. When asked why she came if she believed that to be the case, she responded that she had something worthwhile to contribute. Larson understands that she refers to the artifact that Cassin initially acquired, the Holy Grail of Fire. He promises to heal her father, but it will cost a lot of cash. He tells her to just pay him back later and that he won't know how much until after treating him first. She replies that she doesn't have any. He inquires about the priceless object she mentioned, and she replies that she'll give him that as well. She then promises to do everything in her power to repay him. After the negotiations are finished, he instructs Hampton to scatter a 1,000-year herb throughout her domain and boil the herb in the area's silver seawater to cure the epidemic. Larson tells Hampton not to doubt his light when he says he has never heard of this kind of medicine and asks him to explain it. Hampton starts to respect him and says he'll carry it out. Here, it tells Larson that she has a question for him. When he asks if she wants to know how he learned about the medication, she responds that she does but is unable to understand how. He simply informs her that he is a maiden, and after a brief moment of hesitation, she thanks him for the lesson. She also claims that observing Larson is like observing the patriarch when he was a child. Ludica becomes irate when Larson tells her he will release her right away, claiming she has never given him her name before. Larson then realizes his error and asks how he learned it. He asks if it's odd that he knows her name and tells himself not to be alarmed. Barry, she says. She responds that it is strange when he asks if it is strange that he is using an expensive herb on her. She responds that it is strange when he asks if it is strange that he is sharing a secret that is only known to the Maiden family. And she responds that it's strange when he asks if it's not something that greatly benefits her. And when he asks if she realizes that she just displayed bloodlust toward a potential savior, she becomes embarrassed, replies yes, and she apologizes. When he asks her to say it again, she apologizes and acknowledges that she was wrong. He acknowledges her apology and instructs her to remain here for now. 
He reminds her that she recently attacked the Maiden family when she asks why. When Larson inquires as to what the gatekeeper said, she replies that they told her that it wasn't a place for people like herself and that it didn't matter if someone like her had lost her father, so she was going to kill them all. Because they told her father to die and she loves him. She queries who Larson is and why he is treating her so well when he commands Hera to free her. He introduces himself and waits for her quick mind to identify who he is before asking if he's the scoundrel. He inquires as to whether such rumors exist, and she replies that they do. However, she realizes that the rumors were untrue and that he is actually a good person. He questions whether making her his ally is really the best course of action and decides to continue observing for the time being after another status window stating that an unexpected variable has occurred appears. When the scene returns to the mansion, Hampton is telling Larson that he has gathered the herbs as per his instructions. He will now leave for Hiron and will arrive there in about three days. When the man asks Larson why he helped Lucia, Larson responds that it is unfair for someone to pass away from a disease that can be treated and that because it is her father, he has no financial obligation to do so. Hampton remarks to himself that he has met the true light and tells Larson he will return. However, the holy grail of fire is the real reason he assisted her. We notice that Persia has arrived two days later and wonder what Larson has brought back. She notices Larson and wonders who he is because no one in maintenance has ever been this attractive. She asks how he got so cute and grabs his face while complimenting his appearance after Larson says it's him. He responds that it doesn't feel like he's hiding anything, but we know he is. As soon as he senses that his heart is about to freeze, his magic combat maneuver starts to shield him. She compliments him for accomplishing it all in three weeks, and he is surprised that it activated just from locking eyes with her. She pats his head and tells him that if he keeps developing in this way, she will lavish him with attention. He tells her he doesn't need it and that he assumes it's just another test, and he says he prefers to be her rival or ally to being spoiled. He tells her not to make such a poor joke when she suggests that she decorate his severed head as a work of art. She claims that it wasn't intended as a joke and requests to see the toy he brought back. He questions her motives and informs her that Persia dislikes other skilled fire mages, so he must prevent their meeting. He claims to have found the toy but says he won't show it to her. She declares with killing intent that he keeps attempting to step over her but that he successfully counters this with his fighting style. Her mana keeps pressing on him, but she releases it and promises to give him another chance, and explains that she will only use one finger, no elements, and combat techniques to fight. She responds that she has briefly read about combat techniques when he inquires about her knowledge of them. She continues to compliment him while launching a fire snake in his direction. Larson grinned and assured her that he would use every resource at his disposal to defeat her. His heavenly eye notices the illusion, which he destroys by punching. She compliments him on his development since their previous encounter and promises to leave his toy alone if he succeeds, so he had better give it his all, because she will destroy his toy if she is not amused. Given that he is the son that his father threw away, she never imagined that he would amuse her in such a way. She tells Larson he's too slow and hits him with her finger as he leaps at her. He blocks it, which causes him to fall backward. He stands up and realizes that if things keep going the way they are, he will be at a disadvantage because the distance between them is too great for him to avoid her and attack her. His body will be protected by his iron, so he is surprised that just one finger can completely destroy his mana. He realizes this is his only chance and uses his cultivation to calm his mana. He will be targeting her right leg. She falls after he grabs hold of her leg and swipes her other foot. He then gathers his mana into a fist and slams it into her face. He is shocked to discover that she used defensive magic and that all of the bones in his hand have been crushed. She asks if it was because she let her guard down that he charged him like that, and he replies that it was his only opportunity. She informs him that she disapproves of his fighting style because it is ugly. He holds onto his shattered fist and says, it wasn't classy, but she's still lost. He starts to cough up blood as she lifts him with her magic and throws him against the wall. She tells him that she will ignore his toy because he won the bet, but he keeps piquing her curiosity. She remarks on how tough his body is, but when she uses some force in her last strike to test it, he is still weak. She promises to see him again before bursting into flames. She went overboard because she thought it was interesting that he took his mana. He can learn from it if he uses it properly, but she also added some healing mana. Sando comments that she seems to adore Larson, and Persia tells her that Larson is an interesting man. Persia responds to Sando's remark that she gave him a gift by warning that, while she did give it to him, if he misuses it, his body will disintegrate. It then cuts back to Larson, who is still spitting blood, and we can see in his status window that he has completed a special task and developed an improved self-recovery method. And he understands that he always has a fantastic opportunity whenever he meets Persia. His confusion grows as his body starts to heal and another message appears stating that body restructuring will now begin. He says it feels like his bones are being pulverized as he then begins to experience extreme pain. 
he starts to scream in pain as his fingers start to move erratically, and we can see some nasty ass goo oozing from his ear and other parts of his body. Haria and Lucia enter the room as his techniques start to become ingrained in his body. When Haria notices that the room is covered in black powder, she first wonders if it is poison and later declares that it is too weak and wonders if it is waste-derived fog. Another status window stating that extensive mana is needed for reconstruction then appears, and Larson wonders where the mana is going. He has insufficient mana, and if that persists, the process will halt and he will suffer a terrible side effect, according to a new window. Larson sees fire, then notices Ludica shooting flames in his direction and promising to help. He starts absorbing Ludica's mana because it is excellent for purification. We can see that the body reconstruction is finished as he thanks her and starts to leave her fire. They call out to Larson, and a new window appears announcing the activation of his heavenly body, and we can see that he has significantly added muscle since the reconstruction. The heavenly body, which Cassin was born with, is mentioned by Larson as one of the prerequisites for the attribute known as Sword Emperor, which Cassin possessed from the beginning. And he questions why he keeps receiving items that are intended for Cassin. He requests clothes from Hera after realizing he needs to conceal his attribute. Ludia is seen discussing her father's recovery with Haria after he wrote a letter claiming that everyone in the village has improved and that the epidemic is dwindling as a result of Larson. While reading the letter, Ludica wipes a tear from her eye and promises Larson that she will pay him back for his generosity. She offers to work for her, and later in the story, it is revealed that this is the beginning of the Contract of Fire, a promise that a tribe member can only make once. Also requires them to dedicate their entire lives to the contractee. The future Lucia from Larson's story will vanish if he signs the contract with her, and the original narrative will be significantly altered. But he doesn't care because, by the time he turns 17, he must escape Cassin's control. He tells her if that's what she wants, and she takes the oath in front of Larson. While he is watching the Oath of Fire, he notices the status window mentioning some of the settings are being revealed, and he acquires the authority of Berserk Restraint. Larson explains that in the novel Ludica would frequently go berserk because her brain is smooth, but he can now control her rampages. He tells her that he doesn't want to do it because he realizes that if he doesn't, she will die, however, she responds that it's a good thing. She is unable to respond to his question about how she will have to give up her life for him, but she believes that it will be for the best. She responds that it's cool when he asks why, and he goes on to explain that if he intervenes to stop her rampage, she will perish. She responds by saying it's okay and would be an honor to do so. She responds by telling him to stop worrying because she won't pass away when he says he doesn't want that. She responds that it doesn't matter who she contracts with because she's only nine. He suggests that perhaps it doesn't. He then says that he thinks it's too much of a responsibility and that they are too young to understand the contract of fire. She calls him a good man and assures him that he will wait. At least, her father claimed as much, and explains that he told her not to let anyone go if they reject the contract because they are good people and people she can trust. He tells her it's time for the priceless thing she previously mentioned after she compliments the chocolate on how good it is, and he mentions its location while remarking that it must be the holy grail of fire. Larson asks her for the name of the object, which she says is in her neighborhood, but she only knows that it is a cup. He uses his heavenly eye to learn more about the Holy Grail and discovers that having it makes one immune to poison, capable of withstanding mind magic, and capable of many other wonderful things, making it ideal for a long life. He tells her it's time to leave, and when Harry inquires about his need for an escort, Larson recalls that every maiden requires one. He then wonders what justification he needs to make to his family in order to obtain an escort to Lydia's hometown and he considers his options after realizing he can't lie and that the escorts will be helping one of his siblings. When he decides, the scene cuts to a mage named Jaffel who is not friendly with Larson and is perplexed as to why Larson wants him to serve as his escort. It then cuts to a flashback from three years earlier, where Larson is admonishing Jaffel that he should respect his owner because he is only a dog. Larson regrets acting that way in the past. When Hira asks him what to write on the document, he advises her to simply write that he wants to try their chocolate. Although she claims that wouldn't work, it is immediately accepted. When Larson welcomes Jaffel upon his arrival at the mansion, Jaffel becomes enraged. He explains to Larson how much he has changed since their last encounter and asks if he can ask a question. Larson responds by asking if he is interested in learning why he was chosen to be Larson's escort. Jaffel agrees, adding that he is only a dog. In response, Larson advises him that since the dog is only a guard dog, the owner should also be protected. Jaffel is enraged by this, and Larson tells him that among the dogs, he is the most dependable, and he doesn't believe he will betray him. 
Jaffel asks if he trusts him. Larson responds that he doesn't, but he does have faith in Jaffel's ability to act as an escort and in his ambition. And he explains that Jaffel is incredibly reliable and that he switches from being loyal to his second sister to his fourth brother. When Jaffel inquires about the connection between Larson's goals and his selection as an escort, Larson replies that he might one day be of assistance to him. Then informs Jaffel that he is aware of his plans to switch his allegiance to his second sister, shocking Jaffel. Afterward, he informs Larson that he is just an escort and has no allegiances. Although he claims to be quite emotional, Larson says it doesn't matter to him and asks what other reason an escort would need to protect his owner. Jaffel complies with Larson's request to serve as his maiden protector, but questions how he could have changed so drastically so quickly. He also remarks on how mana rich Larson's circle is, saying that not even the second sister could have such a circle. Ludica is thrilled to see her father when the scene shifts to them walking. Larson explains that while her tribe once possessed tremendous power, that power was expended by the god they serve, and things have gotten worse ever since. When Ludia screams, she lets out what we assume is hockey after we see her take a big breath. We see Hampton arrive, and after apologizing to Larson for not greeting him, he answers Ludia's question about where her father is and informs her that he is at home. It cuts back to Ludia hugging her father, who then thanks Larson. Jaffel is still perplexed as to how Larson was aware of his intentions. Jaffel questions why Ludia is her friend, why the entire community is showing gratitude to Larson, and what Larson did that no one saw. We watch as Ludica takes hold of Larson and leads him to the present, where they eventually find a tombstone made of stacked stones. The Holy Grail of Fire is able to emerge from the rocks as soon as Ludica starts to speak the enchantment table. Jaffel questions what the grail is, realizes that Larson's claim that he came for the chocolates was false, and feels an odd mana emanating from the cup. Larson examines the cup in the heavenly eye, revealing additional settings for the backstory. Why would someone die if they drank from the grail but didn't make a contract of fire? In order to drink from it, he must therefore make a contract, however, the quality degrades the longer he waits. He acknowledges that he will be responsible for managing Ludia and questions his ability to do so. He muses over what the old M might do before making up his mind to ask her to draft the contract. He tells her they must act quickly because she appears delighted that he wants to. She nods as the Holy Grail notices the contract of fire and starts to change shape. Jaffel remarks on how pure Ludia's mana is and how shocked he is to see the Grail glowing, realizing that Larson planned everything from the beginning. He also says that he is certain that the information about Larson has been false. After Ludia informs Larson that the contract is complete, the status window reappears and once more mentions an unexpected variable. Moreover, we observe a tremendous amount of fire energy in Larson before it abruptly disappears and the status window notifies us that the Holy Grail has evolved. Larson seizes the grail and sips the liquid that it contains. As the fire energy is being controlled by his cultivation technique, he commands Jaffel to defend him. Jaffel questions why he is suddenly cultivating his mana in the open and remarks that even a small amount of damage would be extremely harmful to his body. Jaffel puts a protective shield around Larson after recalling him as saying he had faith in his skills. The water from the grail is absorbed into Larson's body as we watch Larson's self-recovery begin to function, but after a while, the heavenly ID begins to function and it becomes nighttime. When Jaffel asks if he's finished, Larson responds yes and thanks him for keeping him safe. Jaffel claims he is merely carrying out orders, but it appears that Larson has attained some level of authority. Jaffel also informs him that this location is the Dragon Mountain's entrance, and he senses a strong mana moving toward them and purposefully alerting people to their presence. Jaffel replies that one of them appears to be very powerful and that they appear to be swordsmen. When asked if he knows who they are, Larson inquires. Larson explains that swordsmen are mages' competitors. He doesn't know why they are approaching, but it's too late to escape because his father would have him killed if he did. Furthermore, there is no point in fleeing from Jaffel. They approach them, and the heavenly ID comes to life. Larson is taken aback to discover that Cassin Shade, the real-world protagonist and the one with the most plot armor, is standing in front of him. The guardian knights of his family are present in addition to Cassin, and Cassin is certain to recognize him as a maiden. Cassin approaches them, bows, and says he came because he sensed a strong mana wave and a surge of fire mana as well. And out of curiosity he came. Cassin claims he doesn't exactly know who he is but is aware that he is a maiden, while Larson remarks that it appears as though he knows who he is. And he assumed he was the sixth son, however, when he uses water magic and there is no sign of water on him, he queries whether he is the fifth son. Aware that it would be challenging if he were discovered lying, Larson wonders how to handle the situation and considers his options. He had wanted to stay away from him. He simply informs him that his fifth brother primarily employs earth magic. Larson laughs and responds that he is very different from the rumors when Cassin inquires as to whether he is the seventh son. Cassin concurs, and we see his guard shock. 
Since they are of a similar age, Larson advises Cassin to speak informally. He also shares some background information about Cassin, mentioning how he has always had a lot of possessions but no friends his own age. Ludia grabs Larson's arm and inquires about Cassin's friendship before introducing herself and complimenting him on his good looks. Cassin blushes and introduces himself, and she praises his name as well. Cassin abruptly changes the topic and queries Larson about the mono wave he just experienced. Cassin remarks that it appears as though he seized a favorable opportunity following an explanation, and Larson responds that he did. Larson responds that the mana protects from outside influences when Cassin inquires about the kind of power it possesses. Cassin quickly realizes it's like poison and other things, and declares it to be a useful power. Jaffa is surprised to see the Shudais just standing there despite knowing they would be defenseless if attacked. As we watch Ludia and Cassin converse, Larson calls out to him and claims he has never met anyone from the Shudi family, let alone someone his own age. Cassin says it's the same for him as well as they shake hands. Larson tells him that he has heard that in the swordsman family, they must first engage in a process known as sword crossing before becoming friends. Larson asks if he wants to participate in a duel after Cassin informs him that it is a duel and that they must first become friends. Cassin denies that it is necessary but inquires if he is requesting a duel. Jaffa is perplexed by the duel request because there are guardian knights on Cassin's side and that he cannot intervene. Larson says exactly, and realizes it's a good opportunity to see how wide the gap between them is. Larson is a maiden, so he cannot intervene to stop him. He cannot intervene because of the Shooty family because doing so might be interpreted as him looking down on the lineage. Larson replies that he has only learned magic combat techniques when asked by Cassin if he has learned swordsmanship. Larson responds that's all he's good at in response to Cassin's observation that nobody is learning those. When Cassin inquires as to why he wants to fight, he replies that he has heard the Matins dislike his family. Everyone is shocked when Larson mentions that Cassin has no friends. However, Larson responds that they are both in the same boat because he also has no friends. He surmises that it is as a result of the families they were born into, and he admits to Cassin that he has trouble making friends because his family forbids them and only permits them when it appears to be for business, and he does not consider that to be friendship. He lacks therefore. He mentions how Cassin's family really values trust and how if there isn't a strong foundation of trust, it can result in someone getting hurt. However, he believes that his family will allow Cassin, which is why he requested the duel. Cassin agrees, and Larson tells him his methods can be thought of as martial arts. Cassin says he'll only employ the fundamental swordsmanship of his family, and since Larson is unarmed, he'll give him the first three hits. Cassin hesitates to respond when Larson asks who would prevail in a duel, Larson then explains that it would obviously be him, but questions why he asked for a duel if he already knew the result. Cassin responds that he wants to be friends. They discuss whether it matters who wins or not. Larson tells him that if he only wanted to win, he wouldn't have asked for a duel. Instead, he wants to be friends and that friends should be on an equal footing with one another. Larson tells him he's going to try his best, so he wants Cassin to try his best as well. Cassin assures him that he has no desire to belittle him. As the duel begins, we see Cassin swing his sword at Larson, but as flow gradually comes on, he avoids it and jumps backward to make room. After being stopped by another thrust from Cassin, Larson tries to close the distance so he can use his techniques. However, if he does so, he will be in the range of Cassin, and if he doesn't, he will continue to be attacked. However, now that he can anticipate Cassin's attack trajectory, Larson is better able to close the distance. He rushes past one of Cassin's attacks, thinking it is a feint, but soon realizes it isn't and that Cassin changed it to a real attack. He realizes this too late to avoid the hit, so he must tank the blow. As Cassin raises his sword to slash at him after he blocks it, we see him writhing in agony and Larson concedes defeat. Jaffa is shocked but relieved that everything went off without a hitch. Larson replies that his arm is fine when Cassin inquires about it. Cassin remarks on his defense and how he was taken aback by the sparks that flew off of him when he hit him. Larson is unsure of what he means by sparks and speculates that Ludmilla may have been involved. Cassin explains to him that his sword can cut steel and is of high quality. Because it struck his arm, Larson is startled. Larson thanks him and says he knew he would lose due to their ability gap. Cassin says he tried to lower the power but is still surprised by his defense. Larson responds that everyone is weaker than him, so it's not strange for the weak to find it difficult to approach him. When Cassin reaches out his hand to Larson and says others find it difficult to approach him, Larson replies that he just felt as if he could trust him. Cassin laughs and says he's never met anyone like him before. This makes me think of the hound and the fox. It was nice meeting him, Cassin says, and suggests they do so again before vanishing. Once more, the status window shows up and notifies you that an unexpected variable has happened. Jaffa inquires as to when Larson first learned fire magic, Larson doesn't recall ever using it, but he does notice that the fire energy close to his heart is weak. 
The water from the grail fused with his cultivation technique, but it's still there and contains fire energy. He uses Heavenly Eye to analyze the battle, and we can see that he used Fire Mana to help block Kassen's attack. However, he is perplexed because it shouldn't be possible to fuse an element with a combat technique, and even if it were, he would need to be an experienced mage like Persia, and even then it would be bad. Jaffa asks Larson how he did it, and Larson replies that he doesn't know. Jaffa is perplexed by this response and believes that Larson actually knows how, but he doesn't want to share it with him. He also wonders if Larson had any prior intention of meeting Kassim, and he realizes he better play his cards carefully because if his plans are this well developed, he must be receiving assistance from someone else, perhaps Persia. As Ludia yells at Larson to retract his statement, he promises to take him back to the Maiden family. Larson is confused by her remark and remembers telling Kassin that he has no friends. He responds by introducing her as his friend and she inquires as to why he told Kassin that first. She then tells him that she considered him a friend, and he admits his error, telling her. And she adds that everything will be fine as long as he is sincere, and she tells him that she will overlook his forgetfulness this time. It then cuts to Larson eating dinner with his mother. When Larson inquires about his father, we learn that Larson has never met him and doesn't have any memories of him. Larson is shocked when she says he's lonely, and we can see from the status window that his father adores his mother. And a voice can be heard saying, I'm lonely, ha. Huh? Decatra, the father of Larson, appears from the portal that is forming on the wall. Larson says that his body is afraid of him and that the air has become dense because of his appearance, making it difficult to breathe. When his father yells out to him and asks if he heard what had happened to him and his brother, Larson nods in agreement. Larson responds that he did it because his brother was trying to push him with his fist rather than magic when his father inquires as to why he did it. And he felt that the honor of mages was being destroyed, so he answered with the laws of mana. Since his brother is a mage, he wasn't seriously hurt, and he wanted to put an end to the fight right away. He also tried to calm his brother down. Additionally, he does not view his siblings as enemies and does not believe that the Grandel family and the Shade family are the real enemies in the succession war. Larson says the sixth brother should be grateful for the experience he gave him in fighting a martial artist, and his father agrees with what he said. Decatur remarks that although he had no expectations for Larson, they were exceeded by the sixth son. If his brother harbors resentment, according to Larson, he has no business being a maiden. Larson worries that he hasn't said enough and admits that he is afraid. Larson says it makes sense because, although it wasn't explicitly stated in the book, his mother would eventually pass away from Blue Dot, and when she passed away, he too passed away. We also learn that the only person his father has ever loved was his mother, and that she is the reason Larson survived until the age of 17 in the past. Larson was expelled from the family because he didn't want his one and only wife to suffer because the other mothers knew he loved her, and because he was previously so weak, he was useless to the family, and he understands that if he maintains his moral character and is successful in defending his mother, everything will turn out differently. He pledges to do his best, and they discuss how magic is ineffective and a waste of time. However, Larson assures him that he will develop the skills necessary to support himself. He will ascend higher and defend his mother because although magic has limits, he doesn't and carries his blood. His father smirks a little before a note from him is read by Hampton and Larson, inviting them to a banquet for the 10th anniversary ceremony, which is when a member of the Maiden family turns 10, at which time everyone comes together, has fun, and is given a physical strengthening magic. It's not just a regular strengthening, rather, a family member gains a mana attribute. Larson enters the banquet hall with Hira as we observe him dressed in a suit. Hira informs Larson that he will be seated across from the patriarch as he surveys the table. Hira replies that his mother wasn't invited when he asks where she will sit. Larson tells his brother Carlin to challenge him again if he believes he lost because he let down his guard after hearing him yell out, Are you Larson? Carlin is surprised by how much Larson has changed. Carlin threatens to trip him up soon, and Larson encourages him to give it a shot. Carlin is shocked when Persia mentions that they had a bet because not only did he make a bet with Persia, but he also won. Persia also greets Larson and asks if he's enjoying the toy he took earlier. Larson is surprised when a blonde woman walks into the room. We later discover that the woman is his second sister, Ivelia, who, despite being kind, would sacrifice anything for her family, and how Cassin murdered her, even though she was also his first love. Larson has changed significantly, she says as she sits next to Persia, and he starts to panic when he sees his sisters because he realizes how weak he has been and how strong they are. It demonstrates how other family members, including his father, enter the room. Decatra congratulates Larson, and others follow suit. Ivelia gets up and declares that she has killed some monsters for her father, and her siblings then share what they have accomplished. Larson is shocked to learn that Persia killed everyone in the temple after stealing a pair of wings from it thanks to the activation of the Heavenly Eye. 
When the door is knocked, Decatra's right-hand man appears, enters, and sits down in front of Larson while carrying a number of scrolls. Decatra then instructs him to make a decision. As he examines them, Larson's heavenly eye opens, revealing how the energy from the scrolls is combining to form a new scroll. He then grabs it, surprising everyone because he had chosen the transcendent attribute, and he tells them he will pick this one. Figured June would be pleased with our boy. Ivelia denies having discussed the scroll with Larson when asked by Decatra, and the other siblings agree. And he's asking if he's supposed to believe that a ten-year-old accomplished something that not even Ivelia could. She claims that he has a better eye than she did when she was ten. Persia is taken aback, and they determine that it's because of his skill with magic combat strategies. Given that none of them acquired it, he orders Larson to bring him the scroll, and as he approaches, Larson gives a quick recap of the elements and how the scroll he chose combines them all. Decatra congratulates him on choosing the scroll and offers to help him with it, which confused Larson. However, Decatra warns that there is a good chance Larson will perish if he does it. He has a better chance of surviving because her mana is weaker than his. Ivelia informs Larson that he will leave the decision to her and that his chances are only 50% due to the danger involved. She responds that she wishes for his strength when Larson asks if she thinks he should choose a different scroll, and she instructs him to remove his clothes, and he starts to pull a magic mic. He then tells her he'll stick with this one. Persia is taken aback by his impressive muscular development and wonders what tricks he may be hiding. As she prepares to begin, he tells her to wait and says he has to tell her father something. We see her put her hand on him to thank him for letting her carry it out. He tells him to do him a favor if he lives. Everyone is shocked by his request, and Larson responds that since it's customary for the patriarch to perform the operation, he owes him this because Decatra isn't. Larson asks if he'll let his mother come see this place while Decatra inquires about the nature of the favor. A lowly being doesn't belong here, the other wives yell indignantly. Larson claims that he is still Decatra's son, so to disparage his mother is to disparage Decatra inadvertently. Larson responds that his mother wants to see him, which surprises Decatra. He then says that if he survives, he will permit it, so try to survive, Larson. Larson's body starts to heat up as if being branded as Ivelia begins the procedure with a chant. He is surprised to discover that he can no longer feel his limbs and compares the sensation to being put to sleep when he hears a voice saying that it will help him. He is startled to see a ball of fire in front of him, and upon closer inspection, he realizes that it is the Holy Grail of Fire. When Larson inquires about his location and the purpose of the Grail, it informs him that it is actually the Holy Grail of Transcendence rather than the Holy Grail of Fire. While Larson recognizes the name from legends and considers the sage Alberto, he is unable to analyze it with his heavenly eye. It informs him that the Fire Clan is misinterpreting him and that he had fire monopered into him by Kirtle. Ask how, the Grail replies that he wants to assist Larson. The Grail explains that his body is unique and that he has a heavenly body, making it strong but insufficient to withstand the mana it is currently attempting to absorb. When the Grail asks him if he knows what will happen if that power enters his body, Larson realizes he would die because his circle is already fully saturated. The Grail claims that he doesn't want him to pass away because he would have to spend another century sleeping and it would be boring. Larson is told that the Grail will consume the mana on his behalf because he must believe it because he knows that if he doesn't, his body will erupt. The Heavenly Eye claims that the Grail has been desperately looking for his true owner, but Larson claims that the Grail never behaved in this way while it was a Cassin's. The Grail informs him that because of Larson's void existence and that this is a prerequisite for taking him in, he meets the requirements to be his owner. When Larson inquires as to what he means, Grail, his new moniker, answers that he'll explain later and that he'll just get to the point and requests that Larson be his owner, and claims that he has currently melted into his heart, therefore, he will consume the mana, enabling him to be reborn as the Holy Grail of Transcendence. Grail assures him that his terrifying sister will handle it, so he decides to take a break inside of Larson's heart and return when it is necessary, and that he'll need to use him frequently going forward. According to the Heavenly Eye, the Grail will function as another monocircle. Larson finds this amusing, and as he prepares to accept the Grail's assistance, his body starts to disappear. In order to avoid dying, he accepts ownership of the Grail. The cup then spews a tremendous amount of flame, and when Larson awakens, Ivelia has informed him that the procedure has been successful. Larson is shocked to be alive and questions whether it was a dream, but he senses the changes taking place in his heart. Ivelia tells their father that the operation failed, the scroll has been extinguished, and she says she isn't good enough, which is heard by Larson. Decatra turns away and tells Larson that it is just his fate. Larson then realizes that it wasn't extinguished, but rather consumed by the Holy Grail. Larson calls out to his father, bringing up their agreement. As we watch everyone leave, Larson puts his clothes back on and expresses satisfaction with how things turned out. He calls out to Hira, telling her to leave, but is taken aback by the bloodlust she exudes, and she states that she has a question she'd like to ask. 
even the heavenly eye cannot read her status window, but Larson is able to detect the presence of a security magic and deduces that only his father could have set it up. When Hira asks who he believes hired her, he replies that he would presume it was his father. When Hira asks why, he explains that she is not concealing her aura despite his father being present in the building. She calls him funny and asks if he can feel her aura. He replies that he can and that it's frightening. He responds that he's only 10 and says she's being weak. Larson explains more about how she is letting out Aura and how even with all of the mages in the building, nobody is coming, so there must be something that is preventing her Aura from being detected. She then asks if his reasoning behind the Aura is sufficient for him to make the assumption about who hired her, and that his father is the only person who has the ability to perform such security magic, and that she had to have been told to tell Larson about her Aura. She responds that he is correct and that if he is unable to analyze the situation, she is free to act as she pleases. Larson tells her he understands the intentions behind all of this and that his father wanted to test him, but Decatur said he would need to be able to do this much to demonstrate he is a maiden. He is correct, Hira says as she pulls a knife. She claims that she genuinely didn't believe he would be able to solve the puzzle. Larson inquires, what did she anticipate happening? Additionally, she declares that she will introduce herself to him and adds that she believed he would pee himself after she released her aura. You can still call me Hira, she says, but without making a sound. When Larson hears the name, we discover that she resembles the Bukaman. Nearly everyone has a fear of her. Even the swordsman's family searched for them as a potential assassin, but they were unsuccessful because there was no information available about her. Larson expresses surprise at her young age and informs her that he has heard of her before because she was wanted, and she expresses surprise that he is aware of it given that it occurred 15 years ago. He asks her if her current appearance is fake after learning how long ago it was, but she responds that she isn't answering that. She responds to his question about how she will put him to the test by telling him that he will succeed if he can block her attack just once. The heavenly eye then turns on but is unable to find her as she vanishes. Larson tells her to wait after she claims that his father instructed her to get rid of him if he became too frail. If he wins, he asks her what she'll do for him. She then asks what he would like if he wins, adding that she didn't think he would. And he requests her protection, saying that he is weak and needs it while she waits for him to become stronger. He was certain that she would agree before leaving again, but he is unable to feel anything. She threatened to kill him, but she won't be able to, so she won't strike above his neck or his heart. He will have to allow himself to be hit in order to deflect her blow, which will cause her to lose her guard. She will target his arms or legs, and when she attacks, he will be alert to her presence. He mentions his ability to flow slowly and describes how it not only slows time down but also enables him to observe mana in slow motion and how its quality has changed. We can see a purple mana ring around his chest, and we learn that the Grail released mana to upgrade his skills. Now that he can see her attack, he realizes it is being directed at his leg. He can avoid it, but if he does, he won't be able to deflect it. He therefore takes the blow to the knee and raises his fist to block it with equal rights and lefts. She responds that it does count and that she will keep her word to protect him going forward, and she vanishes once more. Larson is relieved to have succeeded on the exam. It cuts to her saying she'll start her report, and we see her talking to a candle while mentioning what Larson did. She praises Larson's decision-making and claims that he is special because although her dagger was coated in poison, he picked it up barehanded and is still alive, proving that his mana must have purified the poison. She will find out whether it was luck or not, and then she vanishes. Back in the present, as Larson is moving through the street, Grail appears and asks him if he did well. This startles Larson, but Grail assures him that no one else can see him and that because this dagger had melee on it, he should be praising him. Larson is alarmed to learn that her dagger was tipped with poison, and he forewarns him that if he experiences a strong shock, the poison will rise to the surface and melt his body. When Hampton answers that he does, Larson calls him over and requests the antidote rather than accepting his offer to get some melia. Hira shows up next to him after he dismisses Hampton and informs him that she has been chosen to serve as his shadow and that a new maid will take her place. He also makes a comment about how her attitude has changed. She replies that acting is no longer worthwhile, and he pays her compliments on her acting abilities. He then inquires about the dagger, stating that it had enraged him because she shouldn't have poisoned it if she wasn't planning on killing him. Hira inquires as to why he pretended to be unaware, and he replies that it was so she would know he could survive without the antidote. While she has agreed to protect him, she informs him that there is a time limit and that he must grow strong enough to release her from her duty. She tells him what the poison was, and he replies that he knows and tells her where it came from, which surprises her that he knows. Then, after feeling his throat itch, he tells her to get him water and asks her to get him some powdered thousand-year-old herb. Hira notices that his mana is changing as he pulls out a bag of powdered thousand-year herb and starts to drink it with water. At this point, Grail starts to vomit. Hira notices that Larson's heart is growing, 
and she is unsure of what to do because she is not a mage. She decides to absorb Larson's mana and sacrifice herself in order to save him. We see that the mana keeps growing, and he questions why he keeps having near-death experiences. After a while, his ribs start to crack, but he realizes he can handle it after a status window mentioning how controlling the reaction is only a requirement and how if he doesn't have a special body from a swordsman family, he'll die. However, there is an exception for those with a heavenly body. We see the mana start to condense into his heart as Grail tells him he feels better and to trust him. Grail also claims that his cultivation method is assisting him. Hira observes as Larson's mana returns to normal before witnessing him release fire, but she soon realizes that he has changed into a second circle. She is shocked that anyone could reach it at the age of 10, and Larson inquires as to whether she simply intends to gaze at him. They awkwardly stare at each other as she apologizes and congratulates him. She then asks if he managed to stop the mana expansion on his own, to which he responds with praise and a yes. Larson is pleased that the conditions were satisfied by accident and he asks Hira if she wants to do anything, but he doesn't specify what. The scene then shifts to Noah sleeping and Larson waking him up. Noah questions Larson's presence and discovers the second circle. He asks Larson what he wants, and Larson replies that he wants to fight Hira. We then see them in the practice room. Larson asks if she can duel while keeping in mind his level of expertise. He also asks her not to kill him and to attack more slowly. When she responds that an enemy wouldn't be that way, he responds that she isn't an enemy but rather his shadow. And she concurs. Larson explains that because he is a second circle, his capacity for holding mana has changed. He can now distribute the mana throughout his body as he pleases. The fight begins as we witness his combat magic technique improvement. Hira disappears, and he notices that the pattern is the same as it was before. Although he can't see her, his heavenly eye can still pick up her movements. He should also have a stronger flow now. He realizes that Hira is once more aiming for his leg as we see her charging at him. She is shocked that he was able to see her after he dodged the swing. He then charges in, mana infused in his fist, and punches her in the face. She disappears, and he is holding a knife to his throat while praising her for her strength. She speaks up before him and admits that she broke her promise to moderate her skills. She also comments on how much he has grown and how she hadn't anticipated such a stark difference. He inquires as to whether she is praising him, she replies that she is not and calls him weak. He jokingly asks if she can compliment him, but she responds that empty compliments are poison. Noah is shown watching all of this and is astounded by how easily a maid should not be able to move, how little magic can be used to detect Hira's movements, and how much stronger Larson is than before. He realizes it's best to pretend he didn't see anything after Hira's most recent attack, which is also the scariest part. Noah is surprised that Larson apologized before waving him off and we then see a blade to his throat. He replies that he didn't see it because he was in the bathroom when Hira tells him to forget everything he saw today. Hira comments that Larson was a second circle, but he was still in control of it, and Noah exhibits surprise at this as well. She compliments him on his intelligence before disappearing. Noah is confused about what is going on when the scene cuts to Larson training. Hira tells him that a letter has arrived, and as he starts to read it, he trips and falls. He then realizes that this is a variable. In a flashback, we see Larson telling Hira to notify the main residence after receiving the letter and explaining how he intends to join the succession war right away. The scene then cuts to Dector calling for Larson. Ludica asks to join and he agrees. He also mentions that Cassin wants to be her friend, which Ludica finds comforting. He then says that if he wants to kill a tiger, he must enter its den. After returning to the present, we see Larson see Dectra and Ivelia in a room and decide that it is time to change the world he has created. Dectra responds that he must already know the purpose of his call when he asks if there is an order he wants to give him, and he queries whether the invitation from the Sades is involved, and a candle flickers, an ice magic explosion appears, and an icicle points straight at his throat. When Dectra inquires as to why he set this up, Larson responds that if he had wanted Dectra dead, he would have killed him, but he didn't, and he doesn't believe he has committed a crime. Larson concurs with Dectra's suggestion that the Shaddai should crawl at their feet and behave like dogs in front of them. When Dectra questions Larson about how he knew Cassin would be there, Larson replies that it was just a coincidence. Larson then tells his father about his duel with Cassin. Ivelia can be seen wondering why Larson has changed so much. If it was always this way, it would mean that someone spread false information on purpose, and she realizes that the only person who could have done this is her father. Larson informs his father that he will take part in the succession conflict and that, since he is aware that he cannot become more powerful within the family, he must seek power elsewhere. Larson responds that it's his only chance when Dectra asks if he's bringing an outsider into a conflict between siblings. Larson responds that he is aware of what he is saying and that he is using Cassin to make him his dog. 
He also explains how a trained wolf can hunt a tiger. Dectra retorts that they can also eat their owners, to which Larson responds that if that occurs, it's just fate. But instead of treating him like a swordsman, he intends to treat him like a dog and turn him into a sword's dog. This is a joke in its truest sense. Ivelia asks Larson if he anticipated everything that happened just now, and he responds that he did, but he wasn't aware that she would also be called. The scene then cuts to Larson and Ivelia walking. Dectra remarks that it appears as though Larson has been practicing this conversation because Larson knows she can be relied upon to keep him safe from the Saids. And she asks Larson if the strengthening ritual actually failed before stating that she couldn't speak to his father like that when he was his age. And when she asks what happened to the mana from the scroll, he responds that he is unable to answer because his father instructed him not to divulge the information. And because he couldn't otherwise talk to Dectra in that way, she confirms her suspicion that Dectra assigned Larson to her as a variable. And he'll give him to the other siblings if she can't use Larson well. She must properly raise him though, as he gave her the chance in the first place. Larson extends his hand and tells her he has something he wants to show her. She is surprised as he watches as transcendent mana appears in his hand and transforms into a ball. He inquires as to whether she can see it, and she replies that she can feel the mana's base to be made of fire. It's difficult to hold a physical form of mana, and she wants him to avoid straining himself because he's already a second circle at such a young age. She also mentions how she already sees his potential. She also wants him to live a longer life. When she inquires as to his plans, he replies that they won't be the only family present. Ivelia speculates that the Grandals may also have been invited, and Larson speculates that the Grandal's daughter, Rosalyn, may also attend. He says he will wait for them at the gateway they set up and that they will use. He responds to her question by explaining that he was exiled because of his rude behavior toward the Grandals and his memory of beating Rosalyn with a stick. He assures her that he will apologize to Rosalyn because he was at fault. Ivelia claims that no one in the Maiden will bow their heads. He responds that when a maid's honor is upheld, they won't, but that things change when their honor has been damaged, and that it is appropriate to apologize because he hit Rosalyn and acted in an unmage-like manner. Before he took control of the body, it was trash, so he wonders how he ever beat up Rosalyn. Rosalyn is revealed to be incredibly kind and believes that violence is barbaric when the heavenly eye opens, and he now understands why she will become more aggressive and have a different personality in the future. She changed as a result of him because she was angry with Larson and realized how difficult it is to be helpless, and the family accepted her change because of her talent and martial arts skills. Ivelia assures Larson that she will support him in all of his endeavors. The scene cuts to the gateway where we see Larson and everyone ascending the stairs. Ludica is eager to try every dish at the Cassins, but Hampton is concerned about entering enemy territory even though he believes Larson has great plans and is eager to be a shadow. Hira is unconcerned. We watch them pass through the gateways, taking in a variety of different environments, and learn that they had to pass through 22 gateways before reaching their destination. And although it may sound bad, the city is actually very busy. The Grave of Swords is one of the largest gateways close to the Shooty family. Ivelia checks in with Larson to see if he's alright and tells him the Grand Elves will arrive in an hour. Ivelia wonders what Larson will show her next as he promises to practice his breathing techniques while they wait. Sankin is being spoken to by Decatra, who informs him that the strengthening operation was successful, that it took place in his heart, and that he believes Larson is in possession of the transcendental Holy Grail which was the chalice that Kirtle drank from, but just before he passed away, Kirtle understood the grail wasn't really the grail of transcendence. Senkin claims to have never heard of this, and Decatra asserts that only the Matins are aware of it because Kirtle was close to the first patriarch, and based on his research, Larson is certain to possess the Holy Grail. Additionally, he informs Senkin that Kirtle referred to the Holy Grail as a charger while the first patriarch used to refer to it as a supporting circle. Decatur responds that it is the only explanation for the current circumstances when Senkin questions whether he is certain that Larson has it. Senkin asks Decatur for clarification, to which she replies that Larson is a second circle who has access to attribute mana. And despite the fact that both of them were dubbed geniuses as children, he wonders if Senkin could have been a second circle at the age of 10. Senkin says possibly, but he wouldn't have lived to be 17. Larson, according to Decatra, is currently trouble-free. She questions why he hadn't noticed this talent earlier and informs him that he is concealing something. He commands Senkin to keep an eye on Larson and ensure his survival, at least until Decatra passes away. Cut to Larson greeting Rosalyn and remarking on how the Grand Elf's strength differs from that of the Shads as they arrive. When Rosalyn asks who he is, he smirks at her, reminding her of the beating she endured. She leaps in his direction before landing in front of him asking him why he's here. She makes fun of him when he attempts to apologize to her, and in a mocking voice apologizes. Larson greets him, and we are introduced to Magner. Her uncle laughs and remarks that he should greet his elders first. 
He is the second most powerful member of the Grand Elf family, and he is more skilled in martial arts than the patriarchs at the moment. Magner claims he was going to reprimand Larson when he first saw him, but Larson counters that's not how the Grand Elves operate. Magner is taken aback that Larson isn't afraid of him, and Larson admits his error and promises to make amends right away. Rosalind threatens to kill him if he asks to be pardoned. She strikes him in the face with a punch, but Larson doesn't even move. Rosalind tells him to try blocking her next attack after saying she thought he would appear scared and Magner is impressed. She strikes him in the stomach as his tactics come into play. He grunts and she kicks him away, sending him tumbling to the ground. Larson's magic combat strategy as well as how he handled the blow with Grace astounded Magner. Larson apologizes when Rosalind inquires as to why he is merely sitting there and acknowledges his prior error and offers an apology. She inquires as to what nonsense he is uttering, to which he replies that she was simply too attractive. She is perplexed by this, and he explains that he bullied her because he wanted her attention. She laughs and kicks him in the knee, telling him that if he doesn't fight back, she'll feel better because it will be too boring. Okay, but not here, he tells her. Larson comments that everyone will talk about their fight and warns her that people will be hurt if they fight here. Magner concurs with him and tells them that this isn't the place. We can also see bystanders watching. Magner is impressed by this and so is Rosalind. She says that Larson was going to apologize, and he assures her that he will, just not here. Magner then tells her that they must go to the Chait house. Magner uses sound transmission to converse with Larson, complimenting him and admonishing him to be cordial right away if he doesn't want rumors to start. In another window, Decatur can be seen having doubts about the probability due to the variable affecting the plot. Heavenly Eye alerts how Magner will start to analyze him, and Larson notices this. Yes, a little perplexing. We see multiple numbers form around Larson, a note appears in the air, and it contains Larvian's character information. He also notices that he has fulfilled two requirements, one of which was successful in influencing an important character. Larson will also be granted creator's privilege in relation to probability. He questions why the note has so much blank space, realizes that her setup was inadequate, wonders what the deal is with the probability, questions how he came to possess Larson, and questions all of the opportunities that have presented themselves thus far. He returns to his previous position after a window mentioning a time limit appears. He is now aware that it has a deadline and that he must fulfill certain conditions in order to look at it once more. As they leave after Magner informs him that Ivelia is waiting for them, he muses over potential future changes. Ivelia claims to have grown stronger since the last time Magner saw her, and she promises to defeat him in another five years. Magner says he'll accept her challenge at any time. She tells him that she used to be able to do that, but not anymore. She used to charge at him relentlessly when she was younger, burning all of his hair while he dozed off, he observes. Ivelia is greeted by Rosalind, who asks if she remembers her, and they both laugh about it. She says that she wants to be strong like Ivelia, and Ivelia mentions fighting spirit while explaining how martial artists use their bodies and swordsmen use their weapons. And even though their bodies have limitations, they can accomplish impossibly difficult tasks by using their fighting spirit. It cuts to them having finished their meal after Rosalind promises to help the girl develop her fighting spirit. Magner agrees to meet Ivelia later when she says she needs to speak with Larson. She inquires as to what transpired earlier, and he clarifies that she is referring to the gates before asking if he knew she would attack him, and he replies that he went because she asked him to. He should have offered to settle things at the arena when she said he was going to end her beef. He inquires as to whether she is attempting to deduce the reason why he employed his magic combat maneuver, to which he replies that it was because Magner was present and that he is likely considering the efficiency of his use of the maneuver. Since Larson has a bad reputation, he probably realized that Larson had either changed or been raised to become a variable. Since Larson doesn't know Magner well, she makes the observation that Magner would properly analyze Larson's technique. According to Larson, Manager likely believes that he is a variable and will want to know about him. This surprises her, and now that she remembers that Decatra had advised her to make it clear that he is a variable, she knows why. Due to Larson's excellent planning skills and the fact that he is only 10 years old, making him the most potential of anyone, she desires for him to be a member of her group regardless of Decatra's directive. She mentions how everyone in the Maiden family travels as pilgrims as she describes how she met Magner when she was 14 years old. She would have worked harder to kill him if she had known who he was back then, but she didn't and he remarks on how warmly she appears to be feeling. She claims he advised her to kill him if she became angry and promised to give her three chances. She tells him that Magner is a very curious man, and he remarks that it seems like her memories of him are good ones. Larson says if he is curious about him, he will approach him, and he thinks he will learn a lot from him. She informs Larson that they still have 30 minutes and that, as a commercial city, there is much to see in the area. She admits to visiting many of them, but because of her, they have all been destroyed when Larson inquires if she has been to many of them. 
he takes her by the hand and offers to lead the way as they stroll down the beach. When the scene switches to the Grand Elves, Larson is contemplating how he has changed and how this is impossibly impossible, which is why his likeness was purposefully distorted. He wonders what the grand scheme is and if there is something he is not yet aware of, and that the Grand Elves will be swallowed if something happens because they are weaker than both of the other families. We see everyone enter a portal, Magna remarks that a portal opened by Ivelia is an honor. Ivelia then reminds him that she still has one chance left, and if Larson is at the center of their plans, he will figure out what it is. Cassin calls out to Larson and Ludia as they exit the portal. As soon as Cassin and Larson begin conversing, Ludica steps in to separate them, telling Cassin that she is closer to Larson. Cassin explains to her that he does not believe in friendship hierarchy and that their decision to be friends is what matters most. She is lost because of her easygoing mentality. Get a map for her. She declares to Cassin that she is once more their closest friend, to which he replies that they will both be friends. They then shake hands as she promises to become his friend. Rosalind approaches and says she should not be forgotten because she was also invited. Cassin apologizes and lowers his head. She responds that he can talk to her informally when he says it's an honor to meet her. He talking casually to the others but not to her irritates her. Magner observes, is taken aback by the dynamic Larson has produced, and essentially praises his slyness. We learn that by having some of the illustrious families present, it will serve as the stage for Larson's debut when he asks Cason for a favor and requests that he provide a location where he can duel Rosalind. When Cason's father, Karsha, asks him about the duel, it cuts to Cason saying he's jealous while Karsha responds that dueling with friends is enjoyable. Karsha calls him a scoundrel, but Kaysen claims he's actually a decent person who would make a great rival. Karsha finds it surprising that anyone would view him as a rival, and she appreciates Kaysen's comment that he is currently stronger, and he understands that Decatra's manipulation of Larson's information has made him a variable. When he asks Kaysen who will prevail, she answers Larson, but adds that Larson will lose because of his soft heart. Please introduce Karsha to everyone as he has confirmed that he will be at the duel. The following day at the stage, we see Rosalind and Larson getting ready, and Larson realizes that since it's his debut, he needs to demonstrate his abilities to everyone. Rosalind alerts Larson that she is about to begin and rushes over to him. Flo gradually begins to operate, and he swerves to her side. When she realizes this, she kicks Larson by leaping into the air. He suffered no harm despite her intentions to break a few bones. Ivelia and Larson are shocked, and Rosalind cautions him against becoming conceited because he successfully blocked it by chance. She attempts to kick him again, but he blocks it. She then attempts to punch him, but he again blocks it and swings back at her. She leaps backward to make room, and as she does, we can see that she is out of breath while he hasn't even started to perspire. Everyone is taken aback by this and realizes that the rumors surrounding Larson were all untrue. They now think that Larson has strict training from the Maiden family. Magner considers the fight and how Larson is exploiting Rosalind's openings, taking hits while suffering minimal damage, and says that it's not possible unless he is much more skilled than his opponent, and even with magic combat techniques being weak, he is stronger than most martial artists. Everyone wonders why he's only defending and creating space. He wanted the duel to show how powerful magic combat techniques can be and to highlight the influence of the Maiden family. Karsha claims that it appears that he and Magner are thinking along similar lines, and they both concur that Larson was raised covertly. Nevertheless, if you're curious as to why he felt the need to demonstrate his abilities here, Magner responds that it was to demonstrate the viability of his fighting strategies, and that he probably knew that the onlookers would figure out what was going on. Ivelia is delighted, and Kassin is taken aback by the fight. When the conversation returns to the altercation, Roslin asks Larson how long he intends to be on the defensive. Larson responds, until she's not angry anymore. If that's his intention, she advises acting at least exhausted. She summons up her fighting spirit and strikes Larson in the stomach, resulting in him coughing up blood and falling to the ground. He replies to her that it appears that she wanted him to take at least one blow when she asks why he didn't dodge. She demands that he drink a potion after asking what kind of a duel it is. He thanks her after she says it's her loss, that she used her tenacity, that she will forgive him, and that she won't harbor any resentments. We see that when Kaysen approaches, he is motivated by Larson's duel. He tells Larson that he has greatly improved, and because he is pleased with his friend's development, he wants to duel him. Larson tells him that although he appreciates it, he is exhausted from his duel with Rosalind and wants to face him at his best. Kaysen asks if he wants to have a duel tomorrow, and Larson agrees because he believes he won't win if they fight right now. When Larson approaches Rosalind to ask for a favor, she queries whether he intends to make fun of her. He admits to feeling something when she hit him but is unsure of what it is. He asks for her assistance, saying it will help him become stronger. She asks why she should help him as she continues to ogle him. 
He responds by advising to consider it as a debt for the future. Rosalind appears dejected as she considers how she had been planning her retaliation constantly, but now it's all been ruined. Magner interrupts her train of thought by urging her to try it because doing a maiden's favor in public isn't necessarily a bad idea. Rosalind advises him to make sure to repay her after her one-time assistance. Ivelia is shocked by Larson's declaration that he will swear on the name of a future mage because it implies that he will openly declare his support for the succession war. He responds yes when Rosalind asks if she only needs to strike him as she did earlier. She punches him in the stomach once more while claiming that it isn't her fault if he is hurt. As a result of her tenacity, Larson can see the mana moving in response. He tells her to hit him again weirdo behavior when she inquires if that is all. Magner watches as she strikes him once more and ponders what is happening. Ivelia responds to Karsha's question about Larson's behavior by saying that she doesn't know exactly what his mana is doing, but it's definitely there in responding to her fighting spirit. Larson is asked if he's alright, and although he is now certain that it is his transcendent mana, he is perplexed because he wrote that fighting spirit and mana don't mix in the story, which lowers the likelihood. When he notices it, a notification that he can fill in the missing probability appears, letting him know that there is more for him to do than simply survive. Time stands still for everyone but him as he holds the setup book he had previously seen. As the pages turn, he notices that although it says that mana and fighting spirit don't mix, Larson's mana responded to that in their duel. He notices that the reason is left blank and wonders if he is supposed to fill it in. However, he is aware that if he isn't careful, he could mess up the earlier setups, and since he can't just write at random, he must come up with a plausible explanation that won't affect other setups. He claims that the reason is that the Larson Maiden disobeys the laws of this world. He considered other possibilities, such as the Grail, his transcendent mana, or his heavenly body, but decided that it would be preferable to concentrate on Larson Maiden rather than an outside factor. Larson will be in a regular if he chooses to play a character who disobeys the rules because in that case, he will be exempt from world probability and won't interfere with other settings in the world. Time starts to move forward, but a notification letting him know he can add another line appears. The video then cuts to Lucia sleeping and hearing a knock at the door, which surprises him. Magna asks her to open it, Ludia becomes protective, and she is then asked if Larson appears to be a bad guy or something. Larson exits, and Magna immediately observes that Larson's body is distinct because Larson has been practicing magic combat rather than martial arts or being a mage. Another L joke is made by Smooth Brain about his apps. Magna is surprised to see that someone as quick as Hira is being used as a maid when Larson asks for clothing. Larson asks Magna if he came to see him out of curiosity as they sit at a table. Magna agrees, and Larson adds that he is also interested in martial arts. Larson, according to Magna, appears confident that they will discuss martial arts. Larson assures him that there is sufficient curiosity for it to occur. Magna inquires as to Larson's consideration of the repercussions of learning martial arts from him. Larson explains to him that the Shadows invited him because it is a safe place because Decatur can't see what is happening there. Magna instructs Larson that he will examine his body first. Magna is surprised to see his back but he continues by instilling him with courage and instructs Larson to accept the energy. And to believe him, Larson consents. Magna praises Larson's dexterity, and we see a flashback of him adding another line. As he muses over what gift to bestow upon the main character, Larson chooses to grant himself the unhindered capacity to develop into a fighting spirit. Magna is pleasantly surprised that there is a mage who can accept his fighting spirit when the scene cuts back to the present and we see him absorbing the fighting spirit. Larson responds that he is self-taught when Magna inquires about his teacher. Larson responds that yes, he is acknowledging a maiden using fighting spirit, and that Magna should learn what can be learned as it is the first time he has seen a body like his. Magna wonders if Larson is truly of pure blood because she despises anyone who isn't a mage and is surprised that she's accepting this. Magna laughs and inquires about Larson's desires after Larson replies yes. Larson requests that he serve as his mentor. Larson asserts that he is certain that his methods and martial arts are related and that combat techniques can really shine with fighting spirit magic because it's what they were missing. Larson replies that he did indeed say mentor when Magna asks. Larson responds that he'll make sure they do when Magna asks if he believes the mage would permit it. Magna is shocked by this and inquires as to who he is. Larson responds that he is a mage who desires to learn martial arts. Magna calls him crazy and inquires as to whether he comprehends what he is saying. While it may appear as though the Matins are submitting to the Grand Elves, Larson claims that if he had intended to decline the offer, he would have done so by now. When Larson inquires about his interest in magic combat strategy after Magna realizes he lost, Magna responds that he is specifically interested in Larson. This excites Magna, who realizes that Larson planned this from the beginning. Larson says he knew that he was paying attention, and while he wanted Rosalind to stop being angry at him, he says he wants to create a new martial art. 
Larson tells him that it is most effective when combined with fighting spirit, and it will be his own martial art. Larson tells him it doesn't matter because he's a brat, but he's sure his father will benefit from it as well. Magna warns him that the others will think he's a hostage. Magna tells him that it sounds crazy and he is unsure whether this is because Larson is a woman or because he is a freak. Take advantage of this opportunity to learn everything the matons have prepared for him because he will learn everything on his own, take him on as an apprentice, and he will learn everything on his own. It then cuts to Hampton Eve interrupting the conversation, breaking down in tears, and assuming that Larson is attempting to unite the three great families in a utopian world. He receives a handkerchief here, but he is startled by it, and he warns her that she will cause him to have a heart attack. Hira tells him that Larson will go back to the main family to make an official request, so they might have to take a risk with their lives. She makes the joke that if he dies that easily, he isn't qualified to be a shadow. Hira asks if he won't be punished by the patriarch, and Hampton responds that he will protect Larson because he is his light because it is a shadow's duty. And she vanishes once more. The scene quickly cuts to Larson telling Ivelia that he has something important to tell her. She advises him to wait until later to say it because these moments are too valuable to say anything significant now. When he inquires about her opinion of the flowers, she replies that beauty attracts people. He then states that he believed magic to be the most attractive thing to her. She says it used to be, and we see her having a bad flashback in which she melts some people's skin off. She claims that this experience turned into the most brutal thing she had ever experienced. And the flowers at least don't hurt people. She tells him those words make her heart flutter and she chooses to listen to what he was going to say earlier when Larson promises to give her a bouquet of flowers the next time. She asks him if he wants to become the patriarch, which he quickly declines, and he replies that he plans to stay with the Shats. She then offers to use her special ability to see if he is lying. Larson is assured of her sincerity, and she then asks what made him so eager. She responds, okay, casting her skill by speaking to an enchantment table. She inquires as to what he means when he says he wants to live. Even the sixth brother, he claims, is out to get him. Despite the brutality of the conflict, according to her, no one would kill their own sibling. Larson informs her that in order to become the patriarch, even their father killed off his siblings. Even so, why do you want to stay here, she asks, and he tells her that he needs to get stronger in order to survive. He responds that he wants to protect his mother and himself when she inquires as to whether there is another reason. This affects her, and we see a flashback of how she loves her family without condition. For their benefit, she is either good or evil, and she kills a child even though she doesn't want to because she must protect her family. She loved the family, but she detested the succession war. She made the decision to work hard to become the patriarch so she could put an end to the war, but she needed a magic more powerful than anything to do so, and that she was a witch who craved it. He cites how she chose to kill a monster rather than people and that she claimed to have killed a Balrog, and he understands the significance of being the author. Everything he wrote was just a book to him, but it was reality to them. And even though writing about someone being killed isn't difficult because it's just words, the truth is more weighty than that. He calls out to her and asks if she would think it was a source of pride for him to grow strong enough to defend her. She exclaims, protect me, being startled. When she hears that for the first time, she laughs and remarks that it is always a pleasure to speak with him. Then, after promising to persuade her father, he asks her for assistance. When the scene switches to a pavilion, we see Larson and Rosalind seated next to each other. Luda calls out to him while pointing to the cake and expressing her interest in it as he makes a comment about the classical music. He thanks everyone and receives a gift from Ludia that she says her father said was a lucky pebble after everyone wishes Cassin a happy birthday. Larson believes it resembles a stone he had previously seen by the side of the road. He receives a gift from Rosalind, who introduces it as a heartfelt gift from her and her family. She appreciates that he is speaking to her casually as he thanks her. Cassin agrees when Larson explains that he hasn't made him a gift. Larson tells him he would like to stay here and continue sparring even though it isn't a gift while Smooth Brain observes while eating cake. Cassin is taken aback, and Larson assures him that he will obtain his father's approval. Cassin responds that it is an unexpected gift and that spending time with friends is always enjoyable. Cassin is told by Larson to tell his father and that Larson will get Decatro's approval. When the scene returns to them at the warp gate, Larson explains that he had two goals, to have Cassin by his side and to make the most of Magner. Larson promises to do as Cassin requests and quickly returns. As Rosalind prepares to speak, Larson tells her that he hopes their next encounter will be greeted by smiles. She wanted to speak up first, but instead stays silent and leaves as Larson converses with Ivelia. She queries his comprehension of his actions and informs him that their father's rage cannot be stopped. 
and he declares his confidence to her. When the scene switches to the main house, Larson is seen standing in front of a door and shivering violently. When he enters the room, DeCatros tells him not to say hello because he knows Larson wants to remain with the Sades. Larson responds that this is true, to which DeCatros queries whether he is aware of how this will appear to outsiders. Larson is warned that if he can't understand his intentions, he will interpret them as an insult. As a dagger takes shape in his hand, we see that a mage in the third circle and below will instantly perish. He inquires as to his father's memory of the doghouse of swordsmanship joke. When DeCatros responds positively, Larson explains that he has met a boy named Cassin and that he is sensitive to emotions and relationships. DeCatros claims that. Larson goes on to say that he is sure that he can transform Cassin into a dog. When DeCatros inquires as to whether that is the only motive for wanting to remain, Larson begins to explain how, although magic combat techniques are useless to the rest of the world, he has seen their potential. Larson tells his father about his second circle and how he is unique in his body after DeCatros instructs him to continue. When DeCatros inquires as to whether it is the Holy Grail, Larson responds that it is the source of his special abilities and that his body has already begun to gradually absorb the fighting spirit of the Grand Elves. Does that really seem like defeat, though, given that the Shad Eyes have already invited him, they are already acquainted, and that the offspring of the famous families are mingling with one another, and that the Shad Eyes do not engage in public opinion wars. If someone spreads a rumor that they force the Maidens to do something, he will accept full responsibility and commit suicide. Decatros remarks that he exudes confidence and inquires as to what comes next. As they have extended their hands in unison, Larson kneels and declares that he is confident his father can predict how the world will perceive them and that the best means of governing are absolute force and power. The mark of a true ruler, however, is a warm embrace and modest bearing. Decatros tells him he would have killed him if he had said those things without having changed, and he will watch him to see if he possesses the skills he mentioned. Larson thanks him and assures him that he will live up to his expectations, but informs him that he is only ten at the moment. Larson responds that he needs his mother's care, so please send her to the Shad Eyes with him when Decatros asks if he's complaining. Decatros chuckles and commends him for his people-moving skills. Decatros finds him admirable but regrets that his talent is magic combat. He also thinks it's odd that no one noticed him right away. Another status window appears for Larson, this time stating that the probability of the world is suspect and that it has partially collapsed. Larson is concerned because he will also be destroyed if it completely collapses. As a knock at the door is heard, the scene cuts to Ivelia reading in her office. When Persia comes in, she is reading a book on fundamental magic. We discover that she is reading the same copy of Alberto's magic book that Larson was reading when Ivelia tells her it is nothing. Ivelia assures Persia that she won't dodge the issue and that she has plans to look after Larson when she says that she wanted to tell her something. Persia finds it amusing because she arrived to express the same opinion. Ivelia questions whether her father gave her a chance and ponders whether it comes down to who can control the variable. Persia is informed by Ivelia that it is not her concern. Persia claims that she put in a long-ago bid for him. Ivelia responds by stating that if she doesn't cooperate, she will follow the rules of mana. Persia makes fun of her, predicts that she will fail, and mentions a few occasions when she could have hurt Ivelia very badly, and she would have rendered her crippled if it had been her, but she refrained from doing so. Ivelia claims that she misunderstood, Persia inquires if it's really so, and a bright light is seen emerging from her office. Persia is then shown coughing up blood while being referred to as soft. Persia inquires as Ivelia places her heel on her, and Ivelia replies that she won't answer why she is so intrigued by Larson. Ivelia queries her desire for Larson after Persia claims that the way she is responding is making her want him more. Ivelia tells Persia to stop playing around and pushes down on her when she claims it's because of how cute he is. Persia claims she hired a shadow to follow him, but the shadow vanished after she heard he entered the second circle and that there must be a reason his body is so muscular for a child. Additionally, Ivelia has developed feelings for him. Ivelia understands that Persia came to observe her response. Ivelia advises her to get up because the elders will arrive shortly as a result of the Mona they let loose. Ivelia's response, says Persia, only makes her want Larson more. As Larson and his mother are eating, he makes the observation that having Hira nearby lowers the likelihood of an assassinating him. She replies, of course, and that he must consume a lot of food while growing, after he thanked Hira for the food. He thinks her response is strange, so he examines the food to see if it contains any poison. Hira replies that there isn't really anything special about the food when he inquires about it. Hira recalls a past incident in which she ate poison socks as a child. Larson speculates that perhaps it wasn't anything particularly special, but poison. Hampton cries and falls to his knees, blaming himself, and Larson tells him to first explain. Hira asks how he knew, but we aren't shown the explanation and she gives him the anime protag glasses shove after he tells her its intuition. 
He must have smelled the sock and everything. She then promises to remain his shadow in order to strengthen him, and she assures Soso that the food was prepared by her, so there is no need for her to be concerned. She's good, thanks. That kind of poison is irrelevant because it cuts to Larson lying in bed being told by Grail that he is here. Even with him saying that he looks drunk, Larson claims this. When Lucia knocks on his door and inquires about their departure time, he replies that it will be in the morning. She requests that they leave immediately because she wants cake. She asks, really, when he says they can't enter the gates at the moment, and that she should go to bed now because when tomorrow comes, she will fall asleep right away. Hira is summoned by Larson, who asks her to move Lucia quietly. The exorcist is performed in front of us, and Larson watches in wonder. In the morning, Hampton apologizes to everyone for having to travel by carriage. Due to his clumsy world building, we learn that aristocrats drive cars, and he wonders if this is his first step toward independence as they proceed to the Chait residence. As everyone exits the carriage as they arrive, Cassin calls out to Larson to let him know he knew he would return soon and Larson informs him that the duel has begun and that he is present to keep his word. Larson is pleased that everything is going as planned, but he warns Cassin that it won't be simple this time and chooses to demonstrate his strength. Larson talks about how much he has changed since first meeting Cassin, and that he is now a second circle and a lot better at his techniques. It's time to see how he performs against a foe like Cassin now that he has all of these other buffs. He understands that because of the way he built his character, he cannot defeat him. He is a genius among geniuses and makes other geniuses look ordinary. Despite his incredible talent, he works harder than others, and he combined talent and hard work to become the best. No one can win against him. Larson understands that he must have also advanced. Cassin begins with a thrust, which is dodged by Larson as flow gradually begins to function. The two start charging at one another. When Larson notices his movement and realizes what his next attack is, he also realizes that if he attempts to dodge, Cassin will close the distance and render flow slowly ineffective. Despite the fact that using the sword key by Larson may have been an accident, Larson benefits from it. Both Cassin and Larson are aware of it, and Larson sees that Cassin has lowered his guard. He takes advantage of this and rushes in. Larson decides to advance after Cassin backsteps to avoid him. Cassin will attempt to use his advantage by attacking Larson because he believes he has it. He observes Larson pumping up his fist and getting ready to strike. Cassin raises his sword to block, but Larson strikes it right in the face, using a mana shockwave to erupt from their collision. Karsha and Magna are taken aback, and Cassin understands that he will lose if he lets his guard down. He questions Larson on how he changed into such a different person and grew so quickly. It's too soon to be surprised yet, according to Larson. Magna observes that Cassin's opening strike would have ended the duel if Rosalind had engaged instead of Larson. Sarson narrowly avoids a second sword slash from Cassin. Magna considers how Larson might have felt if he had been born a Grandal, but she later regrets the thought. Karsha asserts that if Cassin were engaged in a fight with the intention of killing, it wouldn't go on for very long, but it's amazing that Larson can anticipate his movements, and he decided to take advantage of the opportunity by charging into Cassin's sword Kai. He also wonders what point Decatra is making with Larson. They are shown being gassed out and sitting back to back. When Cassin remarks on how quickly Larson is developing, Larson responds that he is still lost. Cassin says it doesn't matter and that he is delighted with his friend's progress and strength. Cassin's peerlessness ensures that no matter how quickly Larson develops, Cassin will always outgrow him. He warns Cassin not to be overjoyed because they might become adversaries in the future. When Cassin inquires as to what he means, Larson responds that Cassin is a Sade and he is a maiden. Because they are friends, Cassin claims that it makes no difference. While Larson continues to view him as a friend, he responds that they are unable to escape the world of power struggles. Karsha interrupts their discussion by praising both of them and expressing his pride. In addition to becoming stronger overall, Larson says he wants to surpass Cassin in strength. Karsha tells him that's why he'll make a great rival while Cassin watches, but she queries how he plans to accomplish that. Cassin informs him that he intends to study under Magner. Magner is currently in a difficult situation, but he is aware that because of their public appearance, some people might misinterpret what it means for Larson to be Magner's disciple. Magner queries his family's approval. Larson replies that he does and that he intends to cooperate so that the two families can exchange knowledge. Karsha is taken aback because Decatra ordinarily would never permit this. Larson is informed by Magner that he needs to take a test. The test involves hunting either a red or a white tiger, and adults are not allowed to assist, according to a window that appears. He tells Magner he's going to hunt a white tiger, and since Cassin isn't an adult, he asks if he can come along. Magner informs him that he will be hunting a red tiger and that he never gave him an option regarding the tiger. Magner understands that Larson played him and that he had wanted to hunt a red one all along after Larson quickly agrees. 
He describes him as intelligent and admits that he might have bitten off more than he can chew. It then cuts to the group discussing how the journey will resemble camping. They are headed to a place called Garen, which is close to where the Red Tigers are, and we learn this information. Larson replies that they won't play when Lucia asks if she can come along and play. However, when she reveals that she enjoys camping, he promises to ask Magner. As soon as they get to Garen, Lucia cries out in hunger and Larson tells her to get up and go find something to eat nearby. They are taken aback by the city's lack of life, and when they go to ask a resident why, he is terrified and advises them to leave because bandits are about to appear. Lucia informs Larson that she is once more hungry. Larson knocks on a door, but no one answers. He also wonders what sort of bandits would provoke such behavior in the city. They experience immediate bloodlust and are greeted by a red tiger. We see Clifford and a person riding on it. When Larson uses Heavenly Eye, we learn the man's name is Cadden, that he is a member of a large band of bandits, and that he will eventually take charge of them. Cassin inquires as to whether he is the bandit leader after Cadden asks who they are. Cadden laughs while pointing to himself and inquiring if he is asking him. When asked why he is laughing, Cadden responds that he is not a bandit. He simply likes to hunt people. Larson acknowledges that they will perish if they engage in combat with him. When he says to Cadden that he doesn't know who gave him permission to hunt in this area, Cadden responds that he doesn't require permission. And Larson tells him that there ought to be prominent swordsmen in the city, how then does he have free reign? Larson adds that there are only two possibilities, either it's a covert agreement or the terrible probability he devised. Larson was correct, and the probability is ruined, as Cassin informs him that they are on their way. He is once more granted the creator's privilege as time slows down. He fills in the blanks with something, but it is not displayed. Clifford roars and leaps at them as time unfreezes. They all avoid it, and Larson remarks that it was faster than he had anticipated. He is relieved that no one was hurt. He informs them that it is unmistakably a red tiger and that they will perish if it strikes them. However, Ludia interrupts Larson as he begins to describe Clifford by casting a fireball in its direction. And he says they can eat once she gets rid of it. And fireball is directed at Clifford. Clifford simply eats it as Cadden sits there serenely. They are invited to join the bandit group by Cadden. But Cadden declines because he has no interest in becoming a bandit. And anyone who terrorizes the populace will be killed. If he really wants to die here, Cadden questions. No matter how he thinks about it, Larson yells out, This is odd, noting that he is attacking them even though he has already asked who they are. In flashbacks to the setting he created, Larson smirks, and we see that he stated that Cadden is hunting because he is creating a test. Because a test had been anticipated from the beginning, and Rosalind herself underwent it. Larson informs him that he already knows who they are and that his behavior is a result of his faith in something. And as Larson discusses his sources of faith, a portal appears and Ivelia emerges from it. Cassin is in awe of her as he and Larson observe. The managers in charge of the gates are third circle magicians, so it wouldn't make sense for bandits to be able to harm a maiden business, according to Larson, who claims he knew things were strange because they were going too well. Even stranger is the fact that everyone has locked their doors and fled. Moreover, Cadden hasn't even become a well-known villain yet, and it's possible that he hasn't even hunted a human. And that unless it's Garen creating a fake subspace, which only Ivelia is capable of doing, you can't do these things in the name of a test in a city like this. She asks when he noticed, and he replies that it was when everyone started running away. She then asks if the fight with the tiger was staged, and he replies that he should act more determined on the test. He replies that he has passed when Larson inquires about Magner's opinion. According to the renowned families, as expected, says Larson as he leaps off of Clifford. He apologizes for being impolite and kneels down. Larson tells him not to worry about it. Cassin is the strongest member of Larson's small group, so Magna reasoned that he should lead them and that teaching him would be entertaining. Magna responds yes when Cassin inquires if the exam was to gauge their level of fear in the presence of an adversary. When Larson activates his heavenly eye, we can see that Cassin was correct when he said that must imply that their guardians are also nearby. Magner is taken aback by Cassin and remarks that he wouldn't be able to handle this situation at all if he weren't the author, and Clifford probably would have caused him to collapse. Cassin is asked by Magner if he attacked the tiger because he trusted his guardians. Magner responds that this is a poor reason. Cassin goes on to say that a wise man is not someone who is by himself, and if someone is only physically powerful, they cannot win a proper battle. And even if he does lack something, he would still be living a meaningful life if he had reliable people by his side to make up for it. Larson makes a remark about how Cassin isn't ashamed to admit he's weak and claims that Cassin's strength comes from the people he trusts. Even though Ivla claims that's not something a maiden would think, she cries when she hears him say it. Larson receives a notification that a variable has occurred, but he is unable to view it due to his low proficiency. Although it's not the response he prefers to hear, Magner informs Cassin that he is correct. 
He then asks Larson if he is also aware of the Guardians. Larson, of course, since he shouldn't get hurt during this adventure and it would damage the Shaddai's dignity, but give the Maidens a chance. Ivelia inquires about it, and she responds that it would be disrespectful to the Maidens, and she questions how his being in danger would present a chance for them. He explains that this is because he isn't her, that he isn't important to the family, and that he was recently living in filth. Since he is weak, if someone like this were to get hurt, it would be advantageous to the Maidens, and that the incident might be used by the Maidens to intimidate the Sades. Ivelia asks if this is how a child should think of his family, and he responds that he's just speaking logically and asks her not to misunderstand. She gives him a hug and reminds him that he is still a maiden, that it hurts her to hear him use such language, and that she hopes the name won't be too burdensome for him. Cassin is shaking his fist as Larson thanks her. Larson is confused when Cassin shouts that he will be a part of his family and that he will be much nicer to him. Bloody jumps up on him and tells him she is hungry. They can now eat because the exam is over, right? It then cuts to a few days later after he replies yes. Larson is seen announcing to Magner that he wishes to visit the Taran mountain range because he has heard the scenery is breathtaking, and he wants to go to the actual location, not the one they recently saw in the subspace. Larson declines Magner's invitation to go on vacation and instead mentions that he found something in Ivelia's room that she had made specifically for him. When Magner questions why this is a lie, Larson responds that he sensed a strange mana there, which was her way of telling him she had set up something there. He inquires as to how he was unaware of this, and Larson responds that Mattens have unique communication methods. This is not what it was, Magner buddy. He asks if it's appropriate for him to know such crucial information, and Larson responds that he is his teacher, and that she did so for two different reasons. One is to keep Cassin out of the loop. She managed to kill two birds with one stone by killing one while also checking to see if he would find the message. Larson responds that he won't know until he sees it but he does know the general area where something might be waiting for him when Magner asks. Larson actually knows where it is, that it is a chest plate that was originally intended for Cassin, and that letting Magner leave would be to his advantage. Magner is shocked when Larson reveals the location. When Larson inquires as to what's wrong, he replies that nothing is wrong. He merely has a vivid memory of that location. It demonstrates them leaving a portal as Larson requests a break. Magner declines and remarks that your time is valuable. Larson tells him it will take three days to get there, but Magner counters that it will only take one day. It's only possible for him, according to Larson. Magner responds that he should be able to keep up with a geezer and threatens to leave him behind if he doesn't. As Larson gasps, he can be heard thinking that Magner is crazy because, at this rate, he won't even make it to the area. Larson slumps to his knees and starts to throw up. Magner remarks on his weakness and inquires as to why he has progressed so much. Likewise, Rosalind would not have progressed this far. He challenges Larson, asking how he expects to succeed as a student when he is so feeble. Larson replies, is he going to retract what he said in front of the Shuttas? Magner wonders what it would be like if Larson had his fighting spirit unlocked as he marvels that his breathing has returned to normal. As they proceed, Larson can be seen observing Magner and wondering how he is moving so quickly as if he were the wind. Larson then has an insight and realizes he has been concentrating on sending mana throughout his body when he could have been using it to inhale the wind. He tries it and discovers to his surprise that it works. He also discovers a new attribute-based skill that he can use even though he cannot be an authentic elemental mage like Luda due to transcendent mana. Larson is shown panning on the ground as Magner watches and smirks. He tells Magner that continuing is impossible before passing out. Magner is impressed by his success and reflects on when he was 10 years old, saying that he and his brother, the Patriarch, could not have accomplished what he has. However, he asserts that the more effort Larson puts forth, the lighter his body will become. Shortly after, Larson wakes up after being dragged by Magner. Magner claims to have taken him to the dragon's head while he was dozing off. Larson chooses to act as if he is looking around while he discovers a well and remarks on how the town is deserted. Larson inquires about the memory he previously mentioned, to which Magner responds that it was likely a farm town. Larson tells him he will take a closer look since no one else is in the area. When the Heavenly Eye opens, we discover that a bandit village was conquered, and that he killed more than ten bandits, but nobody knows this. In addition, it was here that he met Mai, a young woman the bandits had abducted. He fell in love with Mai and killed the bandits to save her. However, she was poisoned and passed away before he could bring her down from the mountains. Larson wonders if Magner's inability to move on from his first love is the reason he never married. Larson inquires as to whether this place is unique and then promises to search the area for additional hints. Magner approaches the well and declares that no one will notice it, that it is where he dumped the bandits' bodies, and that he will now look inside. He is surprised to discover nothing in the well and wonders if someone may have taken them. However, he raises his hand and runs into a wall. He understands that the body must also be gone and wonders if it was done to seal the souls inside. 
he decides to break it, but Larson stops him. Larson is relieved to have located the well at last. Larson is perplexed because a barrier is not intended for the well. When Magner inquires as to whether or not he is aware of barriers, Larson responds that he most definitely is. Larson remarks that it's odd that someone would erect a barrier on a seemingly random well when asked how a martial artist would know about barriers. Magner queries what he's trying to say, noting that employing a barrier takes a lot of time and money and that this one is more than 10 years old. Magner thinks that's crazy when Larson says he believes it was created naturally, but when she thinks back to what happened at the well with the bandits and me, she realizes she was able to freely walk around it. According to Larson, a particular setting is the only requirement for an object to erect a barrier. If so, Larson responds, and he has a secret he can share with only him. Magner inquires if that is what mages refer to it as. He then informs him that his eyes are capable of reading supernatural scenes. And as a result, he detects the name from the well. Magner is shocked, and Larson explains that this well, known as the bloodied well, is what his sister wants him to see. Magner notices how unique Larson's eyes are, and Larson remarks on how odd it is that he isn't feeling any blood. Larson responds that's all he can see when asked how much he knows, and then a plume of purple smoke shoots out of the well. We can see that the figure emerging from the smoke is mine. She informs him that a long time has passed. Larson understands that she is a yakai and that the smoke is a pheromone used to entice people. She queries whether Magner sought her out because he couldn't let her go. While he is elderly, she is still attractive, and she inquires as to how it is to see his first love again. He expresses to her his happiness and his relief at being able to let go of the burden he felt when she passed away. She explains to him that since it has been so long, why don't they share a passionate moment? She is more tempted to seduce him now that he is more like a real man than when he was just a kid. Magner calls out to Larson, who is seen grabbing her by the throat and telling him to pay close attention because this is his first lesson. He informs her that there are two ways to hunt Yakai and that she is one of them. First, you can kill it directly, and then you can use energy to kill it. And what he will be demonstrating to him right now is a fundamental Grand Elf technique called Breakage, one of their four fundamental volitions. He exudes a lot of fighting spirit, which is visible, before punching a hole through Mai. When she inquires as to what he has done, Larson realizes that he not only struck her but also destroyed the area she was occupying. My questions whether Magner is actually attempting to kill her and how he is able to harm her in this way. Magner instructs Larson to pay close attention because this is the first approach. Larson assures him he understands before stomping energetically toward her. Larson responds that doing so made his chest tight due to mana, but once should be fine after she asks how he could do such a thing to someone so beautiful. Mai believes that since only one of them can have her, it must be a contest, and starts laughing as she gradually vanishes. As she is walking away, Larson stomps on her and asks Magner why he didn't kill her right away. And when Magner inquires as to what he means, Larson responds that he bets he didn't do it out of love for her. A mage would not be able to use the technique he used to defeat me because they would lose an arm from the amount of concentrated mana, and Magner remarks that he is smart and wonders how his body was able to withstand it. He bonks Larson. He promises to teach Magner something else. Magner responds in the affirmative when Larson asks if he can guess what it is. If it's about covering his eyes, Larson queries. Larson responds that his siblings will be jealous when asked why. Magner questions how such a special person could have come from the Maiden family and why Larson trusts him so much. Larson tells Magner that he believes the dungeon is naturally forming before diving into it, despite the fact that we later learn it is a man-made one. Magner gives him a brief moment of attention before stumbling after him. Magner is taken aback by how deep it is and realizes that the bandit thing was a fake memory. He then wonders how such a strong yakai was not found since Ivelia wouldn't have left it alone. When Larson doubts the likelihood of seeing a window about the character's setting being destroyed, he realizes it is Magner and receives a second message stating that the likelihood is declining. As a result of his shock, Larson is granted the creator's privilege once more, with this time's blank being why nobody found the well after 30 years. Now that Kassin has discovered it, Larson needs to write something that isn't too dissimilar, so he says that only those with the heavenly eye can perceive the well. Now that the probability has been filled in, he waits for the second line to appear. When it doesn't, he wonders if the answer was truly the best one, and if this keeps happening, the world might end. We find out that the nest of a thousand-year dragon is where they land when they reach the bottom of the well. Larson is questioned by Magner as to why he doesn't use magic to explore or research. He is only a second circle, according to Larson, and you must be a third for it. With the mana of a third circle, Magner questions how he is still alive. Larson responds that she wouldn't have put him through more than he could handle when asked whether they should look for other threats. Magner requests that he use magic to lighten the mood, and Larson hesitantly responds that using extra mana is bad. As they proceed deeper into the cave, Larson notices that it is humid, indicating that it must be close by. He then finds a pond, and they then hear a voice telling them to turn around. 
Larson replies that it's just a toy she picked up and is called a bronze giant when Magner inquires as to why she placed this item here. Larson retorts that it's about average after Magner makes a joke about how small it is for a giant. They should return, the giant instructs. Magner claims that if he fights it, he will lose. Larson responds, of course, but he cannot give up here. In the novel, the giant's fire severely damages Cassin, and we see Larson evade the attack. Magner realizes that if he makes one mistake, it's all over for him. He claims he won't be struck by it. He enters the water and declares that he will defeat the giant in a single blow. The giant imbues his sword with fire and swings at Larson, who mostly avoids it but ends up with burns on his back. Magner watches and thinks something amusing is about to happen. He claims that in comparison to what Cassin dealt with in the novel, it is nothing. The giant charges in and claims that even though Cassin tried to charge it directly, he is unable to do so because this is his chance. Larson leaps onto the sword after activating his self-defense ability. He claims that he can withstand the heat for a brief period of time and that he only needs to get to the joint. When the sword strikes a wall, we see Larson take advantage of the opening to climb onto the giant's head and Cassin use the giant's joints against it. He chooses to use the technique that Magner taught him, but a poisoned arrow grazes his back, and he realizes he was too preoccupied with the giant. He is thrown against the wall and knocked to the ground, but it turns out that his attack severed one of the giant's arms. He focused his mana on his fist while avoiding the giant and deflected the sword, which is what caused him to fly. Magner responds that it's okay since he gave him a good show and that he will give him one as well when the mana he has left has been used up. The giant swings at Magner, but Magner commands the giant to disintegrate, and an enormous explosion is witnessed. Larson asserts that this must be what the world setting alludes to when it speaks of supreme beings and expresses doubt about his ability to survive. When the scene switches to outside, we see Hampton and Hira running through a forest. He then asks Hira if they can take a break. He tells her she's just strong when she yells at him for being weak. We see her standing in front of the well as she commands Hampton to wait. She remembers Larson telling her where they would be, that the well would be the door to the dungeon, and where to look for Larson. It then cuts back to Larson telling Magner that he ought to have aided him sooner and telling him that if there is a guardian, there must be a treasure. He offers to lead the way and asks Magner if he also noticed that the giant was covered in an odd oil. Larson remarks that it's odd that it rusted even after being coated in the oil, and Magner is pleased that he noticed. We learn that the oil is there to stop degradation. Magner recalls a time when he was in Ivelia as a child, and he is reminding him of her. Since Latin is susceptible to poison and the giant was rusted, according to Larson, the path must also be laced with it. Larson is informed by Magner that he is correct and that if he ingests the poison, he will no longer be able to move his arms or legs and will be helpless because he is not a mage. Here a Spartan kicks him into it after Larson tells him he has something ready just in case. The scene then cuts back to Hampton, above the attractive inn. Larson informs Magner if there is poison there and whether it has an antidote. That kick was unquestionably personal. When Hampton and Hira fall to the bottom of the well, he sobs and wonders if she's trying to kill him. Hira tells him to get up now or he'll actually pass away. They congratulate Magner as she leads him to Larson. Larson informs him that Decatra gave them to him because of all the things he is lacking. And Magner remarks that while a normal person has an aura to indicate whether they are strong or weak, a person without an aura is frightening. He tells Hira that she is the best assassin he has ever seen, and she responds that if he has seen the others, they are all dead, making her the best. Hampton responds yes when asked if he has poison on him by Magner. Magner gives Hampton some stray animals to catch. When Magner asks when Hampton will get rid of the poison, Hampton replies that he cannot do so but that he can create an antidote. Larson thanks him and pats his head. And with a smile, Hampton responds, of course. Magner and Larson enter the poison, and we see that they have reached the location of the chest plate after Hampton advises Larson that if he holds the antidote in his mouth he will be able to resist most of the poison but not to swallow it. We discover the armor is similar to an extra life when Larson sees it on a pedestal, and a message that only the successor can read this appears, stating that since Magner isn't speaking, only he can see it. He puts the dragon chest plate on, and we watch as it transforms into a form of mana as he realizes that despite being the author, there are things in the world he is unaware of. It cuts to Grail wrapped in a plush blanket and says it feels good. Larson thanks Magner, Magner replies that he should pay him if he wants to express gratitude. In a bath, Larson is telling Cassin about his new armor when the scene cuts to them together. Larson tells him to punch him because Cassin is excited about it, but Cassin counters that it would be better to test with a sword. They are speaking to each other, and Smooth Brain is outside playing with a floaty tube. We learn that mana can be used to restore the chest plate's durability, and Larson asks Cassin to be on guard while he practices some breathing techniques. As we watch Larson use mana to repair the chest plate and express gratitude to Cassin for protecting him, Cassin is ecstatic about stabbing his friend and believes that this is what a hero's friendship is like. 
and Cassin responds, no problem, see you tomorrow. Larson calls out for Hira and asks if she wants to try stabbing him in the chest for real. Hira responds that if she does, he will die, and he tells her to disregard it. She urges him to build up his strength, and he responds by promising to do so. Then we advance one whole year. Magna is stating that the basic stamina training is now complete and they are talking about training as we can see the mountains behind the Shaddai home. Magna promises he won't be duped this time when Larson calls out to his sister and declares he isn't lying this time. Ivelia then welcomes them. Larson is startled and calls out to his sister. She is told by Larson that he missed her. We learn that he wrote her a letter, and she tells him that she wishes it had been written with love and affection rather than respect. He replies yes when she giggles and asks if he wants to take Ludia with her. Ludia has been fighting with monkeys over bananas, as we can see. He responds that she is bound to him by a special contract and that she must obey him, just as he must obey Ivelia, when she inquires as to whether he is asking her to raise someone who isn't a maiden. If she will let him, he says he will work for her. She inquires if he is actually saying that. She asks him what he's been doing for the past year, and although he hasn't improved as a mage, he replies that because his techniques put a lot of pressure on his body, he concentrated on becoming a better vessel for pure mana. He has been working to build a vessel that can withstand that pressure. She yells out to him and asks him who he thinks she is. He responds that she is the best candidate for Patriarch, and she clarifies that she isn't asking about his mana but rather what he has accomplished in the past year. She appreciates hearing that he has realized his error and wants to have dinner with them as a family and he promises to get her flowers as well. It reveals Larson in bed remembering what Ivelia said. He asks her what he thinks she has in store for him and expresses excitement at finding out. When the scene switches to morning, we see Larson asking Ivelia how she slept. She remarks that he appears to be in a good mood and inquires as to whether he is aware of what he must do. He responds that yes, and that in spite of his mana not growing, he needs to demonstrate his strength, and the only test they can logically conduct is to hunt poison goblins in the mountains. She acknowledges his accuracy and requests his readiness to depart. He grabs her hand and begs permission to bring Hampton along as well. We learn they are at the Byron Stone Mountains after seeing them pass through a portal, and it's one of the most hazardous places on Earth. He wrote extensively about this location. Ivelia responds yes when Larson asks if she plans to do nothing but observe. They avoid the poison goblins after spotting a signpost warning them about them, but at least they now know which way to go. How much longer do they have to go? Hampton, who is obviously exhausted, asks. Larson replies that they are almost there. He instructs Hampton to spread the word about what he has prepared when they get close by. Ivelina observes as Hampton distributes items. She had only expected to kill the remaining goblins after Larson killed one because he wouldn't be able to kill a whole pack, but it appears he has something more intriguing planned than she had anticipated. After some time, Larson tells Hampton it's enough and inquires about his ability to climb trees. Larson responds, never mind, and carries him up a tree as he says, perhaps. Ivelia observes and is taken aback by how fluid his movements appeared as a group of goblins appear. Mages would never use a technique like this, she tells Larson, and he replies that he doesn't want to work for her as a mage and that he intends to be someone more exceptional. Ivla now realizes that he set up this plan knowing that goblins live in packs and that Larson and Hampton are still keeping an eye on the goblins. Larson responds in the affirmative, predicting that because they hunt in packs, they will become envious of another tribe's meat and start a fight. For the time being, Larson must merely observe as the goblins engage in combat. Ivelia simply counts the number of goblins who are dying while the goblins continue to fight side by side. There is only one goblin left, and he starts to laugh. Larson notices him when it looks down at him, but it is already too late. Larson quickly closes the gap and destroys the goblin using the method that Magner taught him. Ivelia wonders what her father would have thought if he had watched the deaths of 24 goblins, and she also notices that Larson is sporting some seriously badass armor, and he says he knows she probably wanted to see magic, but he will show her his path of magic because on the way here, he marked goblin dens as they passed by. As they enter a cave, Larson remarks that if the group's leader were a warrior, it would have emerged by now, however, if it were a witch doctor, it wouldn't have done so. When they see the witch doctor, Ivelia's presence has terrified it. As he gets close to it, Larson gives the leader a final farewell while energizing his fist with mana. Ivelia questions Larson if he only approached the leader because she was there as they emerged from the cave. And when she responds that having a weak mind is not a good thing, he nods in agreement. She gleefully replies that she doesn't mind his response, and as they depart, she promises to bring presents the following time because she put him to the test this time. Larson replies that they will stay here for a few days when Hampton asks if they need to walk back home. Hampton is asked if he understands why they are staying, and when he replies that he does not, Larson explains that it is because Hero will notice that they have disappeared and will come looking for them if they wait. 
It should be secure for some time now since they got rid of the majority of the goblins. When asked if he came here to protect the locals, Hampton replies in the negative. Hampton talks about how most people live in places like this and that his parents passed away in a place like this while wearing a dejected expression. And he sobs, telling Larson he's proud of him. Larson agrees, but later he wonders how his sister would feel. Then he realizes that if it is the Ivelia he wrote about, there must still be a test to take. On the count of three, he commands Hampton to dash to the cave without looking back. Then, when the goofball looks up, he spots a huge white tiger. Larson starts to count to three as the tiger roars. Hampton can be seen starting to run in the direction of the roaring tiger. Larson isn't following him, though, and he wonders if he's going to be used as bait. Nevertheless, he carries on with what was instructed. Larson commands the tiger to concentrate on him in a conversation. When the tiger leaps in his direction, he considers how Ivelia was probably disappointed that her test had gone so well. However, since she wants to see her limit, he will comply, and how this wouldn't have been possible a year ago. He says he will breeze through this test and starts to use the wind attribute he learned while following Magner. Calling Cap now, we see them racing through the forest after he asks the tiger if it is confident in its speed and tells it to try and keep up. The tiger bites Larson and bites down, but Larson sidesteps and declares that the tiger is doomed. Larson strikes the tiger directly with an energetic fist before asking what the animal thinks of it. Larson notices he's going to be hit and raises his hands to block the tiger's attack after it coughs up blood. He uses his self-defense ability, but the attack completely KOs him, sending him crashing to the ground like a DBZ combo. His chest plate shows a reduction in durability, and we can see that he has broken both an arm and a rib, and he would have passed away right there if it weren't for his chest plate. Knowing that he can outrun the tiger, he makes the decision to sprint to the cave where Hampton is hiding in order to devise a strategy. Hampton is seen treating him with herbs while expressing his regret. He tells him that if he had only used him as bait, he wouldn't have been hurt. When Hampton starts to claim that it is his job to die in place of him, Larson tells him that he is correct and orders him to stop. When Larson asks him how he would survive if his shadow died, he replies that he would never allow it to happen. Now that they can hear the tiger snarling, Larson respects Larson even more. They then realize that the tiger cannot enter the cave. For a place where many goblins lived, there weren't many goblins outside, so the goblins were trapped in this cave, according to Larson, who also thought the cave was strange. And because the white tiger is sensitive to poison, it was unable to approach, allowing the goblins' poison to accumulate. We discover that Ivelia is the one who actually sealed the goblins inside of this cave, and Hampton asserts that she must have done so to protect the area from the tiger. Therefore, all they have to do now is wait for Hira, right? Larson replies that they won't kill the tiger before Hira arrives, despite the fact that it would be the safest option. Hampton responds that he won't be able to make enough poison to paralyze it when the man asks him to prepare some paralysis poison. Larson responds that they only need to make it uncomfortable enough to warrant not doing that. As soon as the poison is prepared, it cuts to Larson telling him to dismember a goblin and apply the poison to it. While Hampton riles it up, we witness Larson throwing the body parts out of the cave and hear the tiger roar. The image shows them seated while Larson counts down. After 30 minutes, he stands up and we can see the giant tiger is worn out. Ivelia gave him this task because, as Larson points out, it would be impossible for an 11-year-old to hunt a white tiger in this world. He needs to demonstrate to her all of the advancements he made over the past year because of this. He thinks back on the two years since he took over the body and notes that he has seven years until his predetermined death. He must, therefore, transform this world in any case, to improve one's strength in order to surpass Ivelia, Decatra, and Cassin. When the tiger roars at him, Larson signals that a second round is necessary. His blitz tactic is unlocked as a result of his fierce determination. Larson activates the power in a perplexed manner, and we watch as Mana starts to create a blinding light. We can see that Larson has become extremely instinctive as he realizes he now has enough mana to match a fourth circle. He is aware that he can only maintain this form for three seconds and that the skill instantly consumes all of his mana as well as the profound principle of fighting spirit that Magner taught him. Magner explains each of the various types, such as how strength affects both the body and the spirit, how destruction affects both the body and the spirit, how cutting off creates lines on a surface, and how death produces dots from a line, and that this fundamental law underlies fighting spirit. If you comprehended this at all, you're a low-key mega mind. Magner claims that it's essentially possessing a will and that the laws will retaliate when we see Larson with a bucket of water on his head. Larson tells him that he has no idea what he means. Magner says if he punches the land, he can crack the continent they are standing on. Larson asks what he means and if he wants a demonstration. Magner channels all of his grit as Larson laughs and asks what kind of nonsense he is spouting. Larson realizes he isn't joking and orders him to stop, 
but the bucket over his head spills, and Magner queries whether he now comprehends. Back in the present, we see Larson stating that he needs to imbue his mono with his will because he doesn't have time. Moreover, he assures the tiger that he will grow stronger and that he will kill the animal no matter what. While boosting for a one-hit knockout, Larson realizes he only has three seconds left and dashes toward the tiger, but due to the improvement in his physical capabilities, he topples over. He uses his wind attribute to propel himself forward with two seconds left. He leaves a trail of energy in his wake, and as time runs out, he tells himself to be ready to kill, and he decides to get rid of the white tiger. His fist begins to glow yellow, and we witness an explosion. Larson begins to pant and his powers turn off as Hampton watches, puzzled by what has happened. He thanks Ivelia for her reward as he does this. As Hampton approaches him, we notice that Grail has lost all of his energy. Larson is unable to respond to Hampton or even move his body. They hear a second white tiger growling at them out of nowhere, but Larson says it was just what he thought, and we then see Hira in front of them. Larson is told to go to sleep as she dismembers the tiger. She tells Larson and Hampton that she is glad they are okay while still being covered in blood. Larson loses consciousness and goes unconscious. We learn that he slept for four days and had dreams about himself as Cha Sung Min once more as well as his typical days as an employee by day and an author by night. And he completely forgot that he was living in Larson's body during this dream. Panting, he awakens. He says hello to Hira, who replies that he was gone for three days. He notices a jar and is startled by it. Hira explains that it contains the heart of the tiger she killed. He blew up the one he killed. She responds that it is present because it is suitable for mana recovery when he inquires as to its purpose. He thanks her and remarks that it appears that Avilia anticipated her arrival. That's why she prepared two white tigers, but he seems bothered by something, and he tells her that despite the fact that she is carrying a tiger on her back, she should have known about the two tigers as soon as she entered the mountain given her skills. She assures him that a tiger won't slow her down, and since she is the goat, he doesn't doubt her. He claims that given Hera's character and what Avilia must have asked her to do, she must have declined. Avilia probably cast restriction magic on her as a result of this. Hira corrects him and acknowledges that Avilia is listening and that Larson isn't speaking to her directly. He informs her that he should return to training now that his homework is finished. Avilia is seen floating in the open before entering her magic circle, and we observe her conversing with Decatra as he queries about Larson's well-being. She then confirms that he is still maintaining his second circle. He informs her that he should return to training now that his homework is finished. Avilia informs him that she intends to adopt Larson. The war is their problem, he responds, but there is something he would like to ask her, and he inquires as to what Larson has done to cause her to be so upset. She tells him that despite his weaknesses as a mage, she really likes him. He is the most intelligent kid she has ever seen, with just the right amount of conceit. If he would allow it, she would like to adopt Larson. She thanks him after hearing him say that's up to her to decide. After that day, numerous days go by before we experience another time jump, this one lasting three years. And he's now 14. Hira can be seen calling out to Larson and informing him that Decatra's letter has arrived. Larson also requests that Hira cut his hair. Hira then inquires as to whether he has read the letter. Yes, he replies, but he must first return to the main house because a girl must go on a pilgrimage when she turns 14 years old and he intends to travel the world, gather artifacts, and employ members of the family. When she inquires if he means his own people, he replies that he does. She responds that she intends to clean and unpack her room when he inquires about what she will do first at the residence. Since she is no longer a servant, he advises her to hire one to complete the task. When she inquires about his opinion of his haircut, he responds positively and thanks her. She replies that it's nothing and then inquires as to his initial plans, and he tells her he has decided to after giving it some thought, that's how this video ends. If you have sat through to the end, please don't forget to press the subscribe button and leave feedback. See you in the next video.